Yes, to recording. Yes, to recording. And then they're good to go. The we have the Zoom set up, and it's going to. I can't like do this when Reagan's so loud. Hi, Ramona. Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hi. Are you the organizer for this workshop? Uh, yes, I am. Um, uh, but Kate was supposed to come and put me as an organizer. Who yep, am I speaking? I'm, this is Brooke. I'm Kate's colleague. We have five kicking off at the same time, so I'm helping. I'm helping her get this started. So Thank I'm going to go ahead and make. I'm going to go ahead and make you the host. Thank you. I, I believe Reza uh, Reza needs to be the host as well. Okay, no problem. Um, there's no. So you're the host. So you should be able to see who's coming into the waiting room now. So I would just suggest only letting any organizers or speakers in until the start time at nine. Okay. So, uh, um, sorry yeah. about the Can I just say, um, uh, this is the morning session. So for the evening session, we have to like hand over to somebody else. How do we do that? Um, if someone joins the Zoom, you can then make them the host. How do I do that? How do you make someone a host? So, yeah. um, if you look um, at my screen and you hover yeah. over and there you'll see three little dots in the upper right hand corner. Upper upper right hand. I don't, I don't see anything on the upper right hand corner. Uh, actually, you know what? What's going to be easier? If you click on participants on the bottom of the screen. Yes. And then you'll see that I'm listed as Rexus 2022. Uh, Rexus Zoom 20. Yeah. Yep. 20 Zoom 2. Yeah. Yep, and then if you hover over and you'll see yeah. more, more, yeah, and you'll should see something that says make host. Yes. Perfect, so that's what you'll do to the person that needs to be the host when they join the meeting. Oh, got it, okay. And then that'll change the capabilities from you to that next person. Oh, I understand. And how do I make somebody a co-host then when a Reza turns? <laughs> Um, that's going to be the exact same thing. So once Reza joins, you'll um, open participants, you'll find their name, you'll click on more, and then you should see, because there's only two of us in here right now, but you'll see uh, a way to say make co-host. Got it. Okay. Yep. So it'll be in the exact same area. Um, I'm happy to sit here with you until um, yeah. until no. the organizer joins if you need. Sure. Let me just text him. Sure, sure, no problem. I'm just gonna put myself on mute. I am on site at the conference right now, so I'm just I'm gonna mute myself, but I'm I'm right here, okay? Thank you so much. Yes. You're welcome.
Hey, hey, Ramona, this is Brooke with the Rex's team. Hi, Brooke. Hi. Hi. Could you actually make me co-host so I can assist with letting other people off the waiting room? Oh, sure. But I don't see you, Brooke. So if you go to participants on the bottom. Yeah, I mean and oh you but i'm under rexis 2022 zoom too oh i see okay so I'm and then go to more and say uh, make co-host co-host done awesome thank you i'm gonna um, i'm here in the session room with the other presenters so i'm gonna um right now in the meeting we have marco dennis and um yeah. Giuseppe. do you should i let them in uh sure yeah I, uh, let me just make sure that they are the if you go to participants, you should see them there. Yes, I can see, I can see them in the participants. I'm just looking at the, uh, the the workshop. Yes, they should be they should be in really. Okay, and are they attendees? Or are they? Um... Well, that's what I'm trying to check. If you just give uh, me one. So sure. Marco, uh, um, um, Marco is a uh, one of them basically. Okay. So it. Uh, I'm gonna let that's that in. Just, just Marco for okay, now. Perfect. No problem. And, um, let me see Dennis. I don't think Giuseppe is. Neither is Dennis. Only Marco. Okay, we'll just keep them in. And uh, Martin, you want to? You want in as well, Martin? Okay. <laughs> sure. That I can do that. No problem. That's it, Martin. Marco. Yeah. Martin's here, and then. Um, Um, I'm going to make you co-host um, so you can watch the waiting room since so you know people who should be coming in early, correct? Are you talking to me or Marco and Martin? Oh, sorry. I'm, I'm here on site with um, Martin. <laughs> oh, I see. Okay. Hi, guys. I'm, I'm basically right. going to host this. Yeah. Okay. Just give me one. I'm going to mute myself for two seconds, okay? Sure. Okay. And the video is optional. That'll, okay. That'll show you yourself. Hmm. So they need a video. Yes. Hmm. Video is not working. Hmm. Yeah. So this one has to be Hi, guys. Hi. I was working with um, Ramona. I sort of Zoom for her. Um, she's host, but I don't know who she should make co host. Right now, I'm co host, but I think she's one of the organizers. Okay. Co host. So, is there someone that you would want her to do that? You can ask her right now. She's in the meeting as host. Hi. 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 Yes, you should just. Casting on the right of the uh, uh, okay. I come as well. Miss Adiqua Duplica Okay, Now it's working. Yeah. Uh, che devi fare? Eh, fare uscire la chat laterale perché ci stanno scrivendo in chat. Credo. Ok. Participants. Ok. Visualize. Ok. Yes, yes. Ok, Ramona, are you here? Hi, Marco. Hi. Yes, do you, hi. Perfect. Uh, shall, shall I make you co-host? Yes, sure. Thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> Perfect. Nice. Okay. Give me a co-host now. I just want to make sure that you guys are set. Okay. Okay. Um, this other student volunteer, I would admit him as well because he 
Okay. He, I know for sure, knows how to. He's very Zoom skilled. I've been working. Okay. With. Okay. Good. <laughs> Good. <laughs> and then the other thing you can do once this gets started in five minutes, four minutes, if you want, you could remove the waiting room and just let people in. The only way for people to get the Zoom link anyway is through the virtual hub. Uh huh. Yeah, so so they have to log in. So we have not to accept so that. Okay. Kind of so I, I'm removing it now. Okay. I already removed it. So anybody can come in mm -hmm. Zoom through the through the we have no lab to yeah. make any action. Yeah, right. uh, quindi tu cost giusto per far uh -huh. per far um, condividere yes. e quelli che stanno in casa possono condividere tranquillamente. Bisogna renderli uh, okay. host. Are you going to put the virtual okay? Mm, yes, just a question. If there is someone from home that wants to share the screen and video, how can I do? I have to do them. Ah, so okay, the okay. Switcher... Without making them co host, right? right okay. Without making them co host, we set it up so that people should be able to share their screen. Okay, okay. hi, Dennis. They Hello. Be able to do it as well Hello, do you hear me? Yes, sure. Yes, yes. Be... very well. Okay. Okay. Hi, everyone. Okay. Nella chat la lasciamo um, sempre accesa in maniera da vedere la cosa. There's the waiting room is on right now, so uh, I hear maybe it. Ramona can watch it or you can watch it. Because once the presentation starts, people can go in and out. Do you want us to turn it off? I have uh, already removed it. Oh, okay. Yes. I think Marco let everybody in anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's only Fabian waiting to come in. Okay. Allora, forse dovremmo entrare anche nel consumo per vedere le, le domande, domande perché così andrei lì. Ok, so I think. Dennis, can you talk a little bit so we can see if it's not loud Yes, do you hear me well? Oh. So that's on this one here. Testing, testing, one, two. Can you hear me? I, I can ahead. hear you. Uh, Marco, I have a question. Uh, of all of the presenters, there's only Marco, Alexander, and Martin that are in here, right? The rest? A lot better. Yes. Am I right? Peter and Pascal uh, Giovanni are not here, right? Uh, they, are, they are here, but I don't know if they are on Zoom right now. They are just connecting, probably. Yeah, but they are here in presence. Okay, thank you. Because I've got a report back, so okay, I'll write that they're present. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So I turned that up quite a bit. That sounded pretty good. The person mm -hmm. that was just talking. Perfect. Thank you. So that one, I, I can tell you, it's not labeled, but the one that says M4, mm -hmm. this knob here can make it louder or softer. Okay. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, so. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. Um, help with okay. the next two step, eh? Yes. It'll just help you. So once you're going, they can do things like meet people or. Um, okay. Well, you the same. Uh, keep going on a little bit. Right there. Your SV. So it says SV. Oh, SV. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And I have to do. Make co host. Mm, no. Chat. Rename. Remove. Yep. Um, oh, you know what? I think who's who's host right now, Ramona? Mm, host, uh, yeah, Ramona is host. Uh, okay, yes. so I would, Ramona, I would um have her make um just a BSV co-host as well. I don't know if she heard me. Yes, I'm here. I'm oh, still a volunteer. Oh, okay, like perfect. What do you want me to do? Sorry, I didn't. Yeah, we were uh, asking you if you can make co-host also Giuseppe Spillo, DSV. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Give me, give me one second, Giuseppe. Yes. Uh, okay, done. Okay, perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So uh, let me just clarify. We now have Marco, Alexander, Martin, Pascal, and Giuseppe in the room. Yeah. Is there? Is anybody missing or? Uh, yes, just Peter Brusilowski is coming. Okay. Uh, I still don't see him here, but I think that he's coming for sure in a while. Thank you. Yeah, because uh, our starting time is around 9.50, so we have more or less 10 minutes before starting, so for sure he's coming in the meanwhile. The problem is this. Okay. Okay.
Hi, Peter, you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes, we can hear you. Ciao tutti. I can hear Peter from many, many yeah. thousands of miles away. Oh, yeah, in the background. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Dennis. Hi, Peter. I see you with a big mask there. Yeah. <laughs> and now I can recognize it's not a fake Peter. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Just wait a second and yeah, finishing putting the table there. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone who wants Okay, so I think that we are ready to start. So, hello everyone. 
and welcome to the Interest Workshop. This is the ninth joint workshop on interfaces and human decision making for recommender system. And I'm Marco Poliniano. So let me uh, introduce myself and all the other organizers. Uh, I'm working mostly on recommender system and natural language processing at the Department of Computer Science uh, in Italy, in Bari. And I'm working in the same research group of Giovanni Semeraro, Marco De Gemis, and Pasquale Lopes. We organize this, works, uh, this workshop also with uh, Peter Brusilowski, with Alex Alexander Felferning, and Martin Wilson. So let's start from the beginning. So this workshop is organized by a long time. Uh, since 2014, we are organizing this workshop every year. And the workshop was born by merging two older uh, workshops. And the first one was about this human decision making and recommender system. And the second one was about interfaces for recommender systems. So as you can easily uh, understand, the idea uh, behind this workshop is to try to uh, put together these two very important topics of research, okay? From one side, you want to talk about with you and discuss with all of you about users in interfaces. And to the other side, we want also to try to understand what is the relation between user interfaces and decision-making, okay? So let's start to see all together uh, what are the motivations and different topics that we decided to include into, into this workshop. Uh, that's very important, I think, because it can improve and uh, allow us to uh, discuss better during... Oh, there is someone with an open mic. <laughs> so it, it, it can allow us to discuss better during the workshop, to share our ideas all together about this very interesting topic. And every one of you for sure will have time and space for telling us what uh, you think about every, every topic that we are going to discuss. So the first one topic, so the basic one, as I said before, is for sure the one about decision making. So everyone will, has already knows that decision making is the core of the recommender system idea. And it's very important because everyone on our, of us is constantly every day trying to take decision, make decisions and try to select some relevant items from the for everyday task. So when we had to choose a movie or we went uh, going to listen to a song, so we have to make a decision and we have to select something relevant. So the idea is that for sure decision making is important, it's important and it's important when it is supported by a very good user interface and when the user experience, the whole global, um, global we can say user experience is good enough in order to feel the user very comfortable. So in this workshop, for sure, we want to address the latest research issues about interfaces and decision making. So during the last years, for sure, the uh, topic of machine learning has been always more strong and important for all the recommendation system area. And uh, for sure, uh, this is a very interesting topic uh, and a topic that we want to discuss with you here at this workshop. So as you know uh, about machine learning, artificial intelligence and so on, there were uh, uh, especially at the beginning, uh, many things that people are thinking about not very good, like the thing that uh, black, uh, this kind of systems are usually black boxes, and it's not very good uh, to support the final user into the user experience while uh, using in good interfaces for recommender systems. So the idea is that here with this workshop, uh, we are aware of this kind of problem and we want to uh, provide you the possibility to talk about uh, new uh, about the new topics about explainability. And for this reason, in this edition, we decided to include two new very interesting themes the, uh, that are the one about explainability of decision-making models and the other one it is user adaptive uh, explainable AI systems. 
Moreover, for sure, we cannot produce something that it's good for the final user if, if we are not taking into account the human aspects. Every one of, know, uh, of us already know that it's important to feel good while using a user interface, to feel comfortable, to enjoy it, and to make it a part of our life for an everyday use. So for sure, what we have to do while the designing a very good user interface is to try to put in some psychological models, um, but also something about persuasion, uh, about behaviors, uh, and so on. Okay, so for sure, our workshop will continue as the last years to take into account this topic and to propose a very good discussion about the intersection between human computer interaction and recommender system uh, communities. Okay, and we want for sure promote the papers uh, about the psychological foundation that are behind the, the decision making phase. More, uh, there are some more motivation that we are pushing us to organize every year this workshop. For sure, another one is the topic of evaluation. Okay, uh, I think that the topic of evaluation, especially for recommender system, is a very important topic uh, because we have for sure tried to involve the specific user, the final user, into our uh, evaluation. Uh, so we promote for sure user studies and all other the, uh, different kinds of metrics and evaluation strategies that can involve the final user. Because keep in mind that our very important uh, thing is that we have to include the user, we have to feel how good he is uh, while using uh, the, uh, our recommender system and the interfaces that we design for him. And finally, uh, for sure, we are also moving uh, towards new frontiers of interfaces and uh, recommender systems. And for sure, we are moving towards this uh, symbiosis between interfaces, user, and uh, recommender system. What does it mean? The idea is that for sure, these three parts are influencing each other. So we cannot produce a good interface if you are, don't have a very good and effective recommender system. Uh, on the contrary, we cannot have a good recommender system algorithm if you are not taking into account during the design of our algorithm, the final user and so on. So there is a very strong connection between these three parts and we need to think about new, new frontiers of research that are trying to put all together these three, these three parts, okay? So symbiotic recommender system is something on which we want that the community will move forward in the next year and I hope that all of you will do it. So we handed with the motivation and now we have just few statistics about uh, the organization of the workshop. This year we received 13 submissions in particular, we accepted 10 papers uh, and uh, we received papers uh, from all around the world, many of them are from, from Europe, uh, three from Germany, one from Netherlands, one from Austria, one from Belgium. Um, then we have two papers from Japan and one paper from North America. So uh, the event will be hybrid. This means that uh, you will able to follow the uh, meeting, the workshop also uh, online by Zoom, directly accessing uh, to the virtual hub uh, platform, okay? And uh, we have a very exciting invited talk in uh, meanwhile, uh, it will start very soon after my uh, presentation. Then we have three sessions. Uh, one into uh, this morning and two during the, this afternoon, okay? And yes, for sure, three breaks. Uh, all the information about the scheduling uh, is, about, is uh, online on our website. So uh, you can go there and have a look of the scheduling and organize your day. So uh, we will have an invited talk as I was telling before. 
and we have the Professor Denis Parra from uh, the uh, Universidad Católica de Chile with a talk from user control and explainability and recommendation uh, interfaces to visual explainable AI. But uh, he will be introduced more in depth very soon. This is a very brief overview about the scheduling. As I say, now we have the opening, then we have our invited talk. We will have a very small break around uh, half past 10. Then uh, we will have our first session about uh, cognitive factors for interfaces and decision making. And here we have uh, uh, four different co contribution that will be discussed with all of you. We will have a lunch break for sure. Then we will come back into the afternoon with uh, another session about preference, uh, preferences, elicitation, and explanation. And finally, a turf uh, interaction in turf session about interactive recommendation. Okay. And then we will close the workshop and we will go on for the next year. Okay. So that's all from my side. And um, thank you all for uh, having been here in presence or online and enjoy the workshop. Please, Peter. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't know the connect, so that's just. Uh, okay, so just put, uh, this slide, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Okay, uh, thank you for being here. It's really exciting to have so many people interested in, in, in the uh, side and the decision making side of recommendation system. So, human side, and we have just the right uh, keynote speaker for the workshop. Uh, so, I'm uh, pleased to introduce you, Dennis Parr, uh, Associate Professor at the uh, Catholic University of Chile. More formally, it's Pacifica Universidad Católica de Chile. So Dennis has uh, uh, got his PhD degree in uh, University of Pittsburgh, United States and started to work on uh, interactive recommendation system quite early. He ran a few interesting studies while still being a PhD student, and he continued exciting work uh, as a faculty. He worked on several different projects focusing on interactive recommendation systems. Uh, he actually uh, published, I think, one of the first review on interactive recommendation system with uh, Professor Catherine Schreber. Uh, just look at the review. It's a really, a really interesting paper. Uh, and uh, he continues exciting work now preparing his own students uh, who come out and, and present interesting papers and, and many conferences. So it's really exciting to see Dennis, uh, to see overview of his work, past work, and segue to his future work. And the top title is From User Control and Explainability and Recommendation Interfaces to Visual XAI. I guess the first thing is what he was doing in the past, and Visual XAI is something he's doing in the future. And I'm kind of excited to see what he means by, by that. Uh, welcome, Dennis. Thank you for the introduction, uh, Peter, and also for the introduction of the of the whole workshop, Marco. So I, I need the permission to, oh, I can do it now, to share my slides. Um, do you see them? Yes, everything works perfect. Yeah, perfect, thank you. So I'm gonna skip this slide. Where I have been already introduced. Uh, this is a part of my team, alumni, master's students, and, and PhD students working on the topics that uh, Peter was mentioning. So let's go to the to the talk. Uh, well, um, I think that many of us are here in this conference and in all the artificial intelligence applied conferences, very excited because uh, we are living in incredible days since this uh, Dartmouth conference in 1956, where the term artificial intelligence where was coined to the uh, most uh, recent days of uh, deep learning, deep reinforcement learning, and uh, many different uh, researchers and personalities working in this area. Uh, I remember uh, arriving uh, my, my first days in the PhD and seeing these self-driving cars, the emergence of these technologies in 2008, and, and it's really exciting seeing this working on. Also, uh, when in 2016, we saw the DeepMind algorithm beating the world champion of Go, that uh, was also like a, a big program in the, in the area. And more recently, we have seen uh, all these visual language models that are able to connect 
a, a text and image by generation. So here we are seeing some examples of stable diffusion. Uh, the text you see at the top is the is a, like a prompt, and the images that you see are generated uh, automatically. So uh, all these areas is showing really really exciting results. Now um, we have also seen some problems, of course. Uh, here is an example of a uh, research uh, conducted by the ProPublica uh, in 2016 and 17, where they show that this uh, compass system, uh, which is uh, used in the US to predict recidivism, uh, was performing similarly to predict uh, uh, this in, in black and white people. But when the system fail, fail more frequently, uh, against uh, black defendants. So there was a, a case of bias here uh, that was not uh, noticed when the system was built because it was supposedly to be performing as the, the uh, judge uh, trial system was working on. Uh, we also see this other case uh, that was um, described by uh, Joy Bolambuini, a researcher at MIT Media Lab. Uh, which compared technology for recognizing uh, gender uh, and faces uh, with different technologies, uh, but she compared the performance of this technology in uh, male and female, and also in people with dark and light uh, color uh, of the skin. And she showed that there was a, a big uh, performance gap um, with the uh, a software that worked really, really well on dark, uh, on on lighter male and really bad on on darker female uh, faces. So, based on these examples uh, and also on the potential problems that could uh, arise in in different fields, especially critical fields like transportation, security, medicine, finance, legal, and, and military. Uh, in 2017, the DARPA uh, created this program called XAI. That's where this term uh, was created, the explainable AI term. This is a program that was initiated by David Gunning. And uh, the idea of this uh, XAI topic um, was um, like clearly defined in a paper in 2019 uh, by Gunning and, and, and colleagues. And they define an XAI system by its purpose uh, to make its behavior more, more intelligible to humans by providing explanations. And some general principles of an XAI system should be that should be able to explain its capabilities and understandings, explain what it has done, what it's doing now, and what will happen next, and disclose the salient information that it's acting on. So we are asking a lot to, to these systems. Uh, and it is a big challenge indeed, because uh, uh, AI, as it is growing in capabilities, is also growing in complexity. So um, the latest language model, which are these neural networks that are able to uh, understand, well, more or less, more, more precisely to classify documents, to, to perform certain tasks like generate text to, to perform also automatic translation between different languages. The, the latest models like Megatron Turing, uh, NLG Natural Language Generation has uh, 530 billions of parameters. So first you need a lot of data to learn these uh, models, but also it's super difficult to understand the inner workings so of the requirements that they began in post in the, in, in the initial paper. Now, uh, the, there has been many, many like um, works and research in trying to understand this model by different types of uh, strategies for explanations, post hoc explanations, methods like Lime, Sharp, and all which try to uh, accommodate and approximate this model. But there is also um, um, an area where visualizations uh, are tried uh, to use uh, to understand this model or to help humans convey the, the meaning of this model. And, and here we see, for instance, the, the fifth workshop of visualization for AI explainability 
that has been happening in the information visualization conference and is very related to what we are seeing here in, in this uh, particular workshop too. So among the frameworks that have been created, uh, for instance, in 2019, um, Spinner et al. created this explainer framework. This is a framework that tries to show the different steps to create a explainable AI and also considering the visualization. But, but this framework tells you um, everything about the steps on using the different tools available uh, and techniques, but it doesn't tell you how to design and analyze uh, visualization for explainable AI. So there is uh, missing uh, um, research and work in the area of visualization and interaction particularly. There is another very interesting work by Vera Liao, Gruen and Miller, who introduced a question bank in 2020 with guidelines that we should follow in order to create and produce our explainable AI applications uh, and visualization. But again, all this do, do not go through the whole pipeline and process and doesn't tell us how should we design our interfaces in order to make um, um, more effective uh, interfaces for explainable AI. Now, uh, an effective explanation will take the target user group of the system who might vary in background knowledge and needs. We know this from recommendation, recommendation system. All our research and the same workshop has shown that. So how should we proceed under these circumstances, under this variability? And decision-making for analysts, uh, judges, and operator, each user group might have a preferred explanation type. So we might need different types of explanation depending to whom we are directing our, our, our system. Now, in, 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 in all this topic of XAI and unexplainable AI, um, maybe there is a, a bit of disconnection between what these fields are doing, uh, applied AI, explainable AI, and recommender systems. Uh, and, and in this particular conference, there, there is a lot of work that has been done that can be put together in order to advance in these uh, different questions and challenges. So we know of recommender systems, uh, a technology that relies in, in, on AI algorithm and explainability and transparency has been studied for at least 20 years in this area. So I, I was a bit surprised when I read the first paper of XAI, uh, there were no mentions of the research on transparency and explainability in recommender systems. So if we go back to, to the beginning of the 2000, so more than 20 years ago, we already saw two, two papers, one by uh, Herlocker, Constant, and, and John Riddle, called Explaining Collaborative Filtering Recommendations, and another by Sinha and Sweringen in 2002 called The Role of Transparency in Recommender Systems, right? So in the first paper, uh, we had um, different uh, ways that were studied uh, on explaining um, recommendation. But I remember uh, hearing Joe Constant, uh, actually in this version of the workshop in 2012, saying that, that that initial work was really important, but was more about how to persuade people to use uh, uh, a recommendation rather than to explain how it was working. So there was a different definition there or aim. And in the case of the work by Sinha and Sweringe in 2002, they show that uh, a more transparent uh, recommender system of music could provide better uh, positive uh, and a more interaction of the users in the system. Now, uh, then in 2007, to 2015, we had the work of Nava Tintarev uh, and Judith Mastov on explanations in recommender systems. And in particular, they did a, a great work um, collecting different aims and definitions uh, of these aims on why we want to have an explainable recommender system, right? So we had goals like transparency, scrutability, trust, effectiveness, persuasiveness, which was the goal or the, the, the aspect that highlighted Joe Constant on, on his first paper, efficiency and satisfaction. 
So separating this dimension is really important because sometimes we can mix the things that we are doing when we are building these interfaces. Now, this was done in 2007, and we had in 2017 the introduction of the term explainable AI. And of course, in between, we had the Netflix price. There was a lot of, uh, of buzz in recommendation system about uh, matrix factorization and all the latent uh, models that were able to improve the accuracy of recommender system. But the question is what happened between 2007 and 2017 in terms of, of this area, right? So there was indeed a lot of work and research in this area. It was not very, very popular, but uh, it was very influential afterward. And so in the coming slides, I want to uh, show you uh, a visit towards visual user interfaces in, in recommender system. Maybe you recognize, you are familiar with some of this research, but I want to show you a bit of this to connect with what we are seeing now in the area of visual explainable AI. So let's take a trip on this area, uh, just um, to promote this technology to the images that you are seeing here were uh, generated automatically by stable diffusion. Uh, uh, image generation technique by using the, the prompt, a robot explain Netflix algorithms to a human using deep neural network. I find it interesting that the, the images are quite good, but uh, there's a still something, uh, problems like Netflix or Netflix. Uh, so we are seeing, we're going to see this, this uh, technology developing and maybe it's going to have an impact also in how we develop explanation by making the system not only to generate recommendation, but to generate the content and to generate the explanations automatically. Okay, so let's visit all these uh, works. This is not an exhaustive list. Maybe I'm, I'm, I'm missing some, some important work here too, but these are, are uh, like um, uh, a list of, of, of research on, on visual interfaces on recommender system that can serve as an inspiration for many of your works now. So the first work I highlight here is Peer Chooser by, by John O'Donnell and Barry Smith uh, and many other authors in Kai 2008 that they uh, created this interface in Java that allowed the user to have an, an interactive vision of collaborative filtering. So people could click on the center, the active user here in the center and then can see the neighborhood and also then um, explore and interact with the different explanations. Then we had small words, uh, also about John O'Donovan and, and Gretarsson, uh, and they implemented something similar to Peer Chooser, but in this case within Facebook. At the time that Facebook allowed to have uh, applications inside. So, so we learned that you can also have all this process that we always saw as an algorithm, the Pearson correlation and how to have a neighborhood, but also in terms of uh, a visual interface. Now, by this time, we didn't have big user study that, that really gave us uh, more information about what was happening here. We were seeing mostly uh, potential like demonstration of how this interface could work in the area of recommender systems. Uh, now we had in 2010, uh, research by uh, Bart Neinenburg, uh, Reimer and uh, Martin Billensen. Martin is here in this room now. Um, and this was very important work. Uh, it was called Each to His Own, how different users call for different interaction methods in recommender system. They studied different ways to visualize or to present to users um, um, ways to uh, save energy. And uh, one very important message on, on this research, what does the user interface, the details depended on the previous knowledge of the users. So now here with this research, we learn, we need to adapt not only to preferences in the case of movies or, or, or music, but we also need to know what is the background knowledge of this user because it's going to have a big impact on how it's going to be the user experience with a visual interface. Uh, then we had this very influential work, taste waste. Uh, it was not in, in the energy domain, but more in the music recommendation. 
Um, and, and this work uh, that was presented in Rexis in 2012 uh, show us how uh, controllability of the interface and inspectability of the interface could have an important effect on improving the user experience with the recommendation, both with uh, the recommendation themselves, but also on giving the user the control on, on how much they wanted to give the, the system uh, access to sources of information, to different contexts, and also to, to manipulate and somehow simulate how were the recommendations uh, occurring. Um, with this system, um, they also conducted a user study and using this framework uh, uh, created by, by Bart Neinenburg, uh, uh, Martin and, and Alfred Kopsa, they were able to describe how were the different dimensions connected. For instance, the satisfaction was uh, in fact uh, influenced by the trusting propensity of the user, the music expertise, the perceived control, um, and, and also familiarity. So there were many aspects that were actually defining how was the user experience in, in recommender system. Um, now, one, one thing we wanted to explore further uh, was the idea of uh, uh, giving the user the chance to to control different sources of, of, uh, of recommendation or, or, or relevancy, if you want to call it that way. So we adapted an interface called Aduda, Aduna, uh, and we turned it into Talk Explorer, uh, an interface that was uh, helping users to choose papers during conferences. Uh, we conducted this research with uh, Katrin Ferber and, and with Peter Rusilovsky, and, and we found some interesting results in how to nudge people into uh, certain um, elements that would um, satisfy information needs based on, on the different sources of relevancy that they could find in this interface. We then explored even further how to make people aware of different um, ways to, to connect and intersect uh, different recommender systems uh, visually, and we created the set fusion, which was also a recommender of uh, papers, but in this case, they could see it like in a Venn diagram that, that we, we, we found that was a more familiar way to visualize these uh, interactions. And also people could use these uh, sliders to provide more or less importance to different recommenders. So one thing that was, uh, uh, an important finding for us in this research. Uh, first was that uh, people actually preferred papers that were recommended by more than one recommendation systems. So we had most popular content-based author popularity. We are very used to find uh, papers that make different systems compete. But in practice, we learned this from the Netflix price, the, the most uh, used systems and the most effective system are the ones that combine the strengths of different uh, approaches. And this is what we found here, uh, both uh, visually and also when the user did not have control. So uh, this was uh, an important finding in our research. And, and we also found that when people, uh, although they prefer uh, recommendations that are combinations of different sources. They have um, uh, they gave an um, higher rating when when they could control how much they could give uh, importance to one recommender or or the other. Uh, another finding in that research uh, was that we we were a bit puzzled that we found an effect of color uh, and an effect of color supposedly based on the gender that, that, that our subjects were reporting. Uh, I wasn't very sure at the time if that was maybe uh, just an effect of, of, of randomness in, in, our, in our sample, um, in, our, in our subjects. But then we found another research that, that shows that, that female and male have uh, differences in how they find appealing in, in infographic aesthetics, depending on the amount of color. So basically, 
what this shows is that um, males up to certain level uh, of colorfulness, then they, they don't like these infographics anymore. But uh, female, they, they can get a lot more colorfulness and still like these infographics. Mm. Now we have a, a, a now um, a more modern definition of what we understand by gender. We have a, a, we have a turned not just to a binary definition of gender. So this should be maybe studied even further to understand how how this can influence the perception of a, of an interface based on the color palette and what we see there. Now, in terms of the uh, how can we promote an exploratory interaction of people, so exploring the interface and seeing the different options on it, uh, we found that, for instance, in this initial study, Talk Explorer, only 16 people of the explorations uh, were conducted on two or more uh, intersection of entities, but uh, on the set fusion that was based on this Venn diagram, we had that 48% uh, of the explorations were performed over multiple intersections. So finding the right visualization can also really trigger different uh, behavior of the users on, on the interface. Uh, this was more uh, recent uh, research on, on music recommendation, more, more precisely music artist recommendation. We call it multiplay uh, because the how far or close were the artists shown in this interface was depending on, on the mood or the emotion that people felt when they listened to this music. And, and it was very interesting that we found a relationship between mood, but also the mood that people had when they were interacting with the interface. So when the prior mood of the user was uneasy, in general, they were going to give lower ratings independent of the the style of the mood style of the of the artist, but in the other moods they would feel more likely to 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 interact and to give higher ratings even to 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 bands that they were not uh, exactly in the same style as they they used to listen to in the past. Um, now um, another very interesting approach in visualization in three D. It was developed by, by Benedict Loeb, Jürgen Siglet, and Kunkel, and was presented in the IUI conference in 2017. They built this uh, 3D item space where you had something like uh, you had to dig uh, on this latent 3D space. Um, and while you were digging in certain areas, you were finding like a treasure. So you were able to, to find the items that you that you wanted to uh, experiment or, or interact with in this way. At the time, maybe it might look uh, a bit, uh, I don't know, like um, difficult to interact with, but maybe with the uh, new technologies and the upcoming of the metaverse and virtual environments, we might see more of this type of uh, ideas in, in recommendation systems. Um, other more recent uh, work that, that deals explicitly with using visualization to explain the recommendation was uh, uh, presented by, by Cyan and Brusilowski. And what they wanted to do was to present different visualization to explain uh, users the recommendation of papers. Mm. Uh, they use uh, uh, things like a Venn diagram, but of words. Uh, co-authorship graphs, topic similarity, also geographic distance. And they also found that this combination of different ways to visualize the explanation was, benefit, uh, was benefiting the user experience. Um, another very interesting paper in this area of combining these ideas of giving control to the users, visualizing also uh, the interface in different ways, and also trying to provide uh, ways to convey the, the, the recommendation was a study conducted by Martin Nilekam, uh, Nini Toon, Konati, and Ferber, where they particularly study how the, the locus of control, the need for cognition too. So people, some people are, are more willing to, to know or more curious in a way. And the musical sophistication and visual literacy, all this aspect could influence the way that, that people 
uh, interact with the interface and with the explanations that the system can provide. Um, this is uh, also a work on explanations in recommender system, but in particular, uh, recommendations of images, of artistic images. So what we tried to study here was uh, if people were more likely to prefer always a transparent explanation than an explanations that might be, uh, well, le le less transparent. So the, in the case of the transparent explanation that you see at the bottom in this image, um, an item was being recommended and the explanation was based on different characteristics of these images, like brightness, colorfulness, contrast, sharpness, and et cetera. So the user was being said, you are being recommended this because it's similar to this image that you like it, and it has these this similar features. And on the top image, the explanation was given by similarity to other items. So you are being recommended this because it's similar to this other items that you like it in the past. But here the, the, we see a black box, actually. The explanation is, a, is just based on similarity to, to previous items in the user history. Now, what we found here is that people prefer the black box explanation. And it, they prefer this because it made more sense to them. This, this uh, recommendation was made by the uh, Deep Neural Network that have a very good description of the visual features. And the one at the bottom was, was produced by a, a method using features that, that you can actually calculate manually from images, but which are less precise to make recommendations. So uh, this was very important for us because it told us not always transparency is the key, but uh, the key could be that the user understand or make sense of predicting what the system is going to do rather than having a transparent uh, recommendation of the mechanism inside of the, of the system. Um, we, we also move here to, to another topic. Uh, I had some students that really like the um, games online, multi multiplayer online battle games like League of Legends or, or Defense of the Ancient Dota. Uh, they were really interested in that. I, I wasn't into that topic, but uh, they wanted to apply then the, the neural networks and the particularly the transformer technology into, into this uh, topic. So what they wanted to do was to start from uh, a team uh, in League of Legends uh, then the other input is the enemy team that you are facing, and the system has to recommend uh, items that the players can buy when they are playing uh, in the environment. Now, the idea here was also using the attention. The attention are weights that the same neural network provides to different inputs uh, in order to explain why certain items are being recommended. So, in this case, set uh, was being recommended uh, these items and the explanation was that it could be useful to beat maybe it's Syndra. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know the, the name or the roles of these players. You see a little icon here in the, in the bottom right corner because that explained the role that this particular character has in the, in the game. Now, when we ask people if they consider that the recommendations were good, uh, they, they really like them. But uh, when, they, when we asked them if they were useful, they were useful mostly for newer players. But for players that had been playing for almost 10 years, they didn't feel that these uh, explanations uh, were useful. So this was also interesting because it was in line with previous results that told us when you have a important knowledge or common in a topic, uh, maybe you want deeper, more detailed and controllable explanation. But when you are new to, to a field, maybe a non-transparent explanation or an explanation that has a more broad uh, sense of uh, um, interpretability could be enough to, to provide a, um, a, a recommendation here. So I have already 
visited a lot of research. Probably you you are a bit uh, in a burden with with uh, following all all these different topics. But what we have learned from this research in recommender system that can help us towards uh, working or doing research in the new days with visual explainable AI. So first is that the perception of control is key, but how much perception of control really depends on the knowledge and literacy level of the users on the specific domain that you are building your recommender system. Another aspect is that we should let users choose whether seeing explanations or not. Sometimes user can feel a bit overwhelmed uh, by the interface. Maybe they just want to see the recommendation and understand that on their own. So forcing them to use explanations, sometimes uh, it is not needed. Uh, the other thing that explanation should present different levels of detail. Uh, and we should give users control to explore them. So it's a bit of the combination of the two previous lessons. And this reminds me of this uh, Ben Schneiderman, a researcher from the University of Maryland, uh, uh, the creator of the tree map uh, in information visualization. He has a very popular mantra, which is overview first, details on demand. So we can maybe provide certain overview of the recommendation and explanation, and then any detail we can leave the user with the possibility and control to explore further. Um, in some cases, people might prefer a less transparent recommender or explanation if they are able to predict what the system is going to suggest. This is also in line with the definition of interpretability, not as understanding the inner mechanism of a system, but being able to predict what the system is going to do. So maybe dealing with these different ways of understanding interpretability can be helpful in building and, and uh, doing research on recommender system. Another thing that uh, I think uh, this requires more, more research, is, it has been understudied, is that the explanation must provide something beyond the obvious. Uh, the fact that in the research I, I show on recommending artistic images, the more transparent explanation didn't work um, in, in, a, in a conference where I presented this, I, I was giving a, a, a comment that was maybe the, the way of explaining was too obvious. You could see the image and you could see that, that this image uh, had certain level of naturalness, colorfulness, so if you explain me in a way that is, is too obvious, it might not be helpful for, for certain users. And, and I think that we should make, we should see more research on, on, on this. Uh, and another thing is that, uh, another lesson is that the right visual encoding can promote curiosity and exploratory behavior. This could be very interesting. Yesterday in some of the talks of the conference, um, I heard that, that people come with a certain mindset to, to the system. For instance, they entered the Netflix interface and they come to fetch for something, or maybe they want to find something, but not clearly exactly what, or they want to explore. But maybe the interface can promote certain behavior and can help then the user uh, having a better experience, uh, not only with the recommendation, but also with the explanations what we are providing. So um, to finalize, uh, I would like to mention that there is a, a, this paper from 2018 from Abdul et al that uh, he investigated uh, the different uh, trends and trajectories of research that were in accountable and intelligent systems in different communities, psychology, human uh, computer interaction and, and others. And he found that there were a big disconnection between these communities. And, and I think that this is what we observe here too. We see that the, from the area of AI, uh, triple AI and unexplainable AI, uh, they don't find sometimes the, the research which is relevant from the recommender system community, which is more like an applied AI community. And maybe we are not seeing uh, the, the research that is being conducted and is very relevant from other communities like IUI, CHI, or other uh, related topics. 
So going back to now visual XAI, um, I would like to pose this question, which is how do we analyze and design visualization for XAI and using the knowledge that we have learned from a recommender system research for over 20 years and combining it with, with knowledge from other fields. So one thing is that there, there are frameworks and guidelines for, this, for designing visualization. One, one which is very famous, I don't know if you are familiar here in this uh, room, is the Tamara Musner visualization analysis and design framework, which tell you which is the more effective way to build an information visualization. But this is not a specific for designing visualization for explainable AI. So how can we combine these two? Uh, here is a, um, a, a um, two, two different ways to, to see the, 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 the model, the nested InfoVis model by, by Tamara Munster, which uh, has different sections. And one of the sections is identifying visual tasks, what, what she calls the why, where you identify actions and targets. And then you go down to how you finally encode this information visually and you, how you, you, you make your, implement your visualization. So uh, following these, these, these questions, uh, one question we had with my team recently was why every time that we see uh, like an explainable AI library like Lime or, or Shop, we, we give for granted the way that we visualize the explanation. So this is an example. This is the output of Lime, which is a very popular uh, uh, post hoc explainability technique, where for instance, you give us input a document uh, then you want to classify, you build a classifier, you train it. And here you have two classes, uh, atheism and not atheism. It gives you prediction probabilities. And in order to provide explanations, um, it gives you features. The features in this case are the words of the document. And it shows the different um, ways to, to visualize the, the importance of the different words with background color, background color uh, with different uh, levels of luminance. So we wonder why is this the standard way to visualize it? Maybe there, is, there are different ways that can be more effective and that can actually influence the way that the user understands this. So first is that using the framework of, of Tamara Munzner, we found different variations of this. We could, for instance, change rather than the background color of the words, the font luminosity. In this way, you might immediately see the more important words and the other ones are going to be faded away. Uh, we, you also could see maybe other artifacts like adding uh, a bar with different lengths, depending on how much importance a feature has compared to another. Uh, so we conducted a, a, a study this has not been published yet. It, it's been uh, being read it, it's work in progress. Uh, we train a, um, a classifier with a neural network, very recent neural network called ExcelNet. And then by the classification that we obtain and the importance of different words, we ask physicians to tell us where, what do you think about this classification? Can you confirm? And also can you tell us if the explanation that we are providing is useful. Uh, this is the, an example of the interface and a screenshot. You can see here, these are documents related to COVID um, um, uh, research. We, this was conducted during the pandemic. And we had here the prediction of the model, here the abstract, and here the, the subject had to classify the documents. And then uh, also they had to tell us if they found the, the highlighting of the different words useful to decide the, the classification. And, and we had different like hypotheses. In this case, the hypothesis was, we want to use the effectiveness principle. The effectiveness principle in visualization tell us that if you want to uh, visually encode one information, you have to use it with the more effective channels. And the effective channels are the ones that are more aligned with, with human perception. So in this case, we have 
Well, a control group without any highlighting. We have uh, the highlighting of lime. That is, uh, you put more importance with the background color, but you can also put the importance with word luminous and also with a bar length. And, and this is theory in information visualization, where you know that the more effective channels are more aligned with the user perception, with the human visual perception, and the less effective channels like luminance are less aligned with visual perception. So you might think that one word is 10 times more important by the other because you cannot easily see the difference between a bit more color luminance or, or a bit more. And, and we found that a, a background color saturation, a, the, the, the model that Lime uses is actually a, the, the most preferred by the user, but not always. It depended actually on the document type. We found word luminance being the, the, the most preferred in a different document. And bar length, which is the most effective channel, uh, was the less preferred. And this was interesting because it tells us that for this particular task, uh, the um, effectiveness principle in visualization is not the appropriate for telling people these are the most important feature to explain what the prediction model is doing. So uh, to conclude, um, XAI and visual XAI are very active topics uh, of uh, critical research in artificial intelligence these days. Uh, despite uh, explainable AI being coined as a term in 2017, uh, as a REXIS IUI community, we have been doing this research since the early 2000s. And there are important lessons that can be uh, get together to contribute to the research in explainable AI. Uh, and there's still a need to connect different disciplines and areas to address the challenges in both explainable AI and visual explainable AI. So uh, with that, I conclude my, my presentation. I am open to, to any questions and, and comments. Uh, thank you for the great presentation. It was nice to see excellent overview of past work and uh, view to future work, also very much interesting. So now we have time for questions. So please, uh, uh, first, uh, get, get, get a shot at uh, local people, for example, two questioners, and then I will see who is doing it online. So just come to the microphone if you're in the room, make a line, and uh, I will see who is uh, uh, asking questions remotely. So if you're remote, please put your question in the chat. Uh, we'll try to, to, to read it. Not yet? All right. <laughs> oh, oh, my time first. All right. <laughs> first. Hi there, it's a great presentation. Um, I was wondering in XAI, they make this important distinction between local and global explanations. How would you? Do you think that that same distinction is important in Rexis, or, or are you only doing local explanations most of the time? Yeah, that's a great question, Martin. Uh, effectively, I, I didn't go on the details of uh, explainable AI. Usually, when you talk about the, the, the global explanations, you are mostly talking about explaining the whole model. For instance, uh, a matrix factorization model in general. And, and when you're talking about local explanations, uh, you expect an explanation for a particular decision. Let's say, why did you recommend this particular item or this list of items? Um, my feeling is, is that uh, following what the research tell us, uh, for, for people who are getting into a system and, and maybe are not very familiar with the domain, um, I think that maybe a local explanation can be enough and maybe can even be better to satisfy the, the need of information or, or of interaction with a particular item. Now for more um, informed people, more knowledgeable of the topic, uh, having a, an overview uh, of, uh, of, the, of the whole system, so a global explanation 
can be also be, be useful and maybe needed in, in many cases. So I would say that both uh, local and global explanations are important and are going to depend on, on, the, on the type of user that we are dealing with. Uh, okay, so we have uh, one question in Zoom. So then is, uh, uh, the Yeah, I, I see it. Uh, yes. There is a question here by Omar. Uh, who says, um, could you please explain more details about the model you built for ExcelNet? Uh, sure. Um, so this is, uh, ExcelNet is a, is a language model. So the, the, the language models are, are um, in this case, neural language models are neural networks, uh, especially designed and built um, to, to manage um, natural language, in this case, text. Mm. And usually a language model, uh, you have two, two, two ways of using it. The first one is training it. And, and the training, uh, sometimes very simple, is uh, just predicting from a sentence, masking certain words, hiding them, and then trying to predict by the context that it gives you the whole sentence, what is the word that is missing? You train it in this way. Um, there are other objectives sometimes uh, involved, but this is the main, the main way to train it. Um, in the case of ExcelNet, it's autoregressive. So it means that you don't just mask or hide any word. You mask the last one. So you try to predict somehow the future based on the, on the history of or the past uh, words. Uh, now, um, Probably everyone has heard of BERT, uh, B-E-R-T, which uh, a few years uh, happened to be the first transformer-based uh, language models and was very successful. But BERT had the issue of uh, being able to manage only a, a small uh, input size, like 512 tokens. And ExcelNet uh, was able to manage more than that, maybe 1,000 or, or, or even more, depending on how you uh, um, did the architecture. So in our case, ExcelNet was very important because we were classifying documents uh, on different types for this COVID um, uh, classification task. And we were able to somehow uh, process the whole abstract. If you use BERT, you have to use only a small portion of it. Now. ExcelNet then was trained to classify the, the, the documents, but we wanted to provide explanations. Rather than using a post hoc model, like a Lime or Sharp, we wanted to use the model itself. In this case, the neural network provides um, a mechanism called attention. And with the attention, we can somehow tell you this input token has this much importance. This other input token has another amount of importance. And we use this information to then visualize it to provide, let's say, more luminance, color luminance, or font luminance, or to change the length of the bar behind the, the word. And, and then here we were combining, uh, trying to understand the effect of visualizing the attention, but also trying to tell if attention itself was a good way to explain uh, the way that this uh, model was classifying the documents. I don't know, Omar, if, if this uh, answered your question. Yeah, okay. uh, your, your question here, if uh, how we use ExcelNet to get important keywords, we use the attention in the last layer using the, the, the average of the different heads because uh, actually you have different heads of attention in, in the... In, in the in the Excel net model. Uh, there is there are more questions, so uh, we yeah. can share. So we have a questions from from audience here. Please just start with introducing. It would be great. Yes, hello. Uh, thank you for the nice talk. I'm Karen Gunzer. I have a question about uh, multi-sided systems. So um, most of the XAI research, it seems, uh, focus on explaining to the end user. Uh, but there's also systems where the providers of the IDs might be interested in knowing how the system works. Uh, do you have any insight in what kind of differences you should consider if you want to explain the system to the providers? 
Well, that, that's a very, very interesting question because um, one thing I didn't mention here, I just mentioned it at the beginning as a motivation, the, the aspect of fairness, right? And fairness is one of the, and, and, and bias is one of the main motivation that, that, uh, that pushes the research on, on explainable AI because we want to use explanation to understand if the system is biased against or toward a, a protected group and, and in, in the area of, of uh, uh, fairness, accountability, and transparency, as you mentioned, uh, you want to be fair to the users, to different groups, but you also want to be fair to the creators. For instance, there is a very interesting research by Mike Ekstrand and, and Sole Pera in, um, in terms of, of recommending books, but you want to see if you're recommending from a a female or male authors in the same way. So I think that you can combine uh, all these works related to a fair ranking in terms of uh, using that uh, for visualization uh, and for explanation. Now, how to do that? Uh, right now, I, I can think easily of ways to do local explanations, combining what, what Martin was asking but to do a global explanation of a, of a model uh, which makes ranking, that, that's not a, an, an easy uh, task. And, and I think it's, it's an open research problem. So, but, but, but I think that it, it is very important to consider, apart from what I mentioned here, the fact that among the, the, the people that you want to make recommendations to, you also want to recommend to, or you also want to provide a, explanation to the creators who, who are providing their their goods or their items to, to being recommended. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. It looks like there is no uh, so far. I, I have a question here that was sent as a direct message in Zoom. Oh, okay, okay, sure. Please let it yeah. I don't so see I, I will read it uh, aloud. It says, uh, what do you think about uh, taking into account psychological aspects like personality, emotions, mood, or personal characteristics when generating explanations of recommendation? Yeah. Uh, also very, very interesting because what I have seen is how to take this into account to make recommendations, but not to make the, the explanations of the recommendation. So, um, I, I think that that could be also a very interesting area of research. So not only consider this, this aspect that we have studied in the past to, to recommend, but how to explain. Maybe for, I don't know, different uh, emotions or for different perso personalities, we need to provide more transparent or maybe less transparent recommendations. That could be a very interesting uh, topic of research to, to pursue. Okay, uh, yes, I, 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 I have a question myself. So uh, thank you, Dennis, for pointing the, to the work on uh, artistic image recommendation. And I think it has an issue related to many other work on recommendation recently. So it was not a very successful recommendation when you try to explain it too deep, but maybe just not because of the depth, but because of the way you try to explain. It. When we try to see artistic images, like new paintings, it's certainly not because of it's slightly bluer than uh, my previous image, because maybe the same, a painter and the same type of painting, but it's not like you like selecting the uh, wallpaper for your for your room, right? Which is kind of like the same as my floor, right? So and that's kind of sub symbolic things, which not that easy to for human to comprehend. There are several studies in different uh, related fields where it shows that while AI work might be based on sub symbolic things like unigrams for example, or neural network features for humans explaining on that level and acting level is very hard. So they need kind of some, some symbolic level. So there are some old work with artistic images in the museum has been explained on the basis of semantic categories and that was successful, right? Uh, so what do you think about that? Maybe we should try to recommend using one set of uh, things, some symbolic neural network, unigrams are fine, but when we explain, we should get closer to semantics, which makes sense for people. Do you have any position about that? Yeah, I think that it, you, you are right. You need to find the, the right uh, conceptual level to explain. Uh, if I explain you, uh, uh, let's say, a, a classification of an image by telling you because of these two pixels, doesn't make too much sense. 
in human in sense, we want to see, ah, we, I think that this is a cat because it has uh, ears or it has like whiskers, right? So in, in the same way, I think that there is a big now opportunity uh, because of the, um, of the visual language models and the generation models that, that you can also provide like a context and input. So maybe you can use this, uh, the fact that you can generate things in order to make recommend the explanations of recommendation. And in this particular area, I think of uh, using the text in order to, let's say, generate similar images and telling because of the style, because of uh, Puntism, Van Ho style or Cubism, whatever. And maybe it's going to help us more easily to, or, or you can ask, you can also provide like visual question answering. What is the style of this image? And then you can provide that as an, as, a, as an explanation in a more dialogue way because of the infusion of, this, uh, uh, of these technologies. I think that that's a very promising area and I would like to see more research on, on that too. Okay, uh, we still have time for one short question. If anyone uh, wants to talk that to the microphone. Uh, last question, one. Oh, <laughs> please. Uh, we have to finish the session in two minutes, but if you will ask in 30 seconds, Dennis has one minute, 30 seconds to answer. Hi, uh, my name is Luis. Uh, I have a question about the results that you presented about document classification. So you showed that in some cases, people prefer color highlighting, in other cases, they prefer the luminosity of the text. Uh, and I was just thinking about it, like in your previous slide, you presented that people have different references from color palettes. So I was wondering when you're doing the text highlighting with colors, color saturation, what is the effect of color palettes? And if changing the color palette would actually change the preference on the right when you said that what we have is the preferred mode. Yeah, I, I don't know. I I just, I heard a few keywords, so I I know that 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 uh, the question is about the the uh, the the visual uh, feature, uh, but I know exactly what uh, is the question. I, I can right. It's something sorry. I I can I can tell what the essence of the question. What if it's not just color versus black and white, but the type of color when you which you use highlighting in your in your uh, biometric image study? Maybe if it will be not a blue or red, but orange, maybe it will be different results. What do you think? Right. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, well, there there are many many possibilities actually. What we what we used here was a, a particular color, and we use that color because it it uh, poses uh, no problem for uh, colorblind uh, people. So so in particular, purple is going to be seen even if you if you are able to see colors or not. Uh, so. Um, I understand there are many possibilities in the space of of, uh, of visual channels, but uh, I think it it, it is very uh, important to to start connecting this field because if we have this knowledge from the experiments, trying to understand how to visualize things more effectively, and and we want to know how to make interfaces rather than assuming that this thing is going to be better encoded in this way. We have to make this experiment. Maybe the question you are making is it makes sense. We should test that, but then we need more experiments in, in, in this area. Uh, uh, thank you, Dennis. Uh, there are kind of more interesting questions coming in the chat, but we don't have time. But we now have a break. Uh, uh, so uh, you can look at ask more questions. Dennis may have a chance to answer. But before we do it, we want to thank Dennis for Really interesting, insightful talk. Thank you very much, Dennis. I hope you will stay with us for the rest of the workshop and will participate asking questions. Uh, yeah. Okay. A round of applause. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Guys. Very nice Welcome. talking to you here. So get out, get some coffee. There is a, a, a monorail coffee, just like two steps out of this. If you know, I say good, good coffee there. And I will see you in 30 minutes.
Hello, online people. Uh, it's time to get back. I think people are coming back. So welcome to the first session of the workshop. This session is dedicated to cognitive factors. We have four presentations three online and one in person. And the first presentation is about examining choice overload across single list and multi-list user interfaces. It's a joint work of Alan Stark, Justina Sedrowska, Mir Chunan, and Bruce Arvuelta. And the presenter is Alan, Alan Stark. Please, Alan, you can show the slides. Yes, thank you very much. <clears throat> right. Well, this is uh, hello, Seattle. This is Norway calling. I'm alive from a rainy uh, Bergen on the West Coast and uh, very happy that I can uh, present my work here about examining choice overload across single list and multi list interfaces. Uh, it's work that done together with the students from uh, Jönköping University, uh, so Justina and Mir. And uh, Bruce Faraday was also our, our fourth collaborator, our third collaborator. So what uh, I will show or what we try to show in this paper is that we compare three different UIs, recommended UIs, and their effect on choice overload. And uh, these are a single list interface that you scroll through, that each position is one single item. Uh, there is a grid where there is like a block with, uh, for example, four times three or five times three, uh, multiple rows of different items and a multi-list. And a multi-list you might know of having explanations and different uh, algorithms per row in the interface. And what we show in this paper <clears throat> is that uh, we find a higher perceived ease of use uh, for grids and multi-lists compared to the single list, but we don't find much differences in terms of choice overload across the three interfaces. Well, let's uh, provide some context to these findings. Um, I will use a lot of pictures of myself in this presentation just to, to keep it the style going. Um, so choice overload can manifest into many different responses or emotions. Uh, it can be to the extent that you get a bit angry or that you're frustrated that you can't really find what you're looking for. Uh, you might defer from choosing at all. Uh, that's, uh, the, the decision is so difficult that you do not want to make a decision anymore. And uh, yeah, usually you're not very happy about it if there are too many options to choose from. <clears throat> so choice overload generally uh, manifests itself if the choice set is too large. And especially uh, what can happen in recommended systems is that if the options are very similar to each other, that you can't uh, decide easily between them. So, and there are a few measures that we can take into account here. So first there are behavioral outcomes. So not wanting to choose, or maybe if there is an option that you can choose multiple things that you choose fewer of them. For example, if you would experience choice overload in an online supermarket, uh, the process choosing might take much longer. Um, the interaction is maybe perceived as effortful, um, more clicks are needed, et cetera. And the experience aspects are also important. So typically when we talk about choice overload, it's a combination of uh, choice difficulty and choice satisfaction. In Netflix, uh, the multi-list interface is quite apparent in the sense that uh, you have multiple rows of uh, uh, lists uh, along with explanations. 
and uh, each, each list presents a different algorithm or is constrained to a different factor. And um, in this case, um, the explanations make most of the difference between a standard grid-based interface, where maybe also single uh, algorithm is used, and the multi-list as we know it in many, uh, for example, video streaming interfaces. So there have been some studies in recent years about the empirical effects of multi-list interfaces, uh, sometimes also referred to as uh, carousels, compared to grids or uh, single list UIs. So one uh, paper found reduced navigation effort and uh, fewer exiting of the interface uh, when you're using such multi-list. Um, there's also a higher diversity and uh, and then in turn experienced uh, higher experience choice difficulty and satisfaction. So typically when your choice, the choice overload typically manifests itself as having a negative. So it's difficult to choose, but also a positive. So, well, I'm happy that there's more to choose from. Um, and other papers find that people are actually slower in their decision, but explore more things. Um, or that they do have a preference for multi-list, but it may depend on the personality of the user. And this is only the work that has been done in the past, let's say, 18 months. <clears throat> um, so we compare three different UIs below. Um, and we also base ourselves on uh, yeah, more work from a human computer interaction when it's just about the UIs and not really about, let's say, recommender interfaces. So this paper from Kammerer and Gerrits uh, they find varying effects between typical single list UIs and grids on exploration and choice. And uh, what is also noticeable that, uh, let's say, in the recommender system discourse, uh, when people talk about multi list and single list, they typically refer to uh, multiple algorithms and single algorithms. I'm also guilty of that. Uh, so when we typically what happens uh, in these papers in at Rexis is that we just have a grid, but um, yeah, the, the grid is presented as a single list because there is a single algorithm underlying them compared to the multi-list. But if you look at it from the UI perspective, then a single list is really what we see on the left here and a grid is more what we see in the middle. So there might be some confusion when it comes to terminology here. Um, with regard to the research questions, uh, we examined the differences across these three UIs for choice difficulty, choice satisfaction and ease of use. So the methods, um, we had uh, three different uh, vegetarian recipe websites that were set up by uh, our, the, the second and third author of this paper. And um, in each case, people were asked to choose uh, one recipe that they would like to cook at home. And this is what it would look like to the user. So we had 150 participants from a convenience sample the evaluation aspects that we measured, uh, they were inferred reliably. And we also attempted to measure choice behavior. And we want to use heat maps for that uh, to, to see what people inspect. So whether we can build upon earlier work regards, with regard to that. But uh, something went horribly wrong there. We only got three participants heat maps. So unfortunately, I can only present the evaluation aspects here. So with regard to choice difficulty and choice satisfaction, uh, we actually did not find much difference across these uh, different UIs. Um, I mean, we can nitpick about uh, the x-axis and that's, you know, grid and multi-list are a bit lower than when it comes to choice difficulty, but it just varies very little across these three UIs. And yeah, you don't, we don't even replicate the higher choice satisfaction from many of the studies that we've seen before. Uh, for the multi-list compared to a single list. Uh, for the ease of use, it was mostly apparent uh, that um, the grid and the multi-list uh, were easier to use than the single list or rated as such. Um, made some misspellings here on the left, but I wonder, what I tried to say is that uh, ease of use uh, was also negatively related to choice difficulty uh, and Choice difficulty was, of course, negatively related to choice satisfaction and received ease of use then positively to choice satisfaction. So we have a few preliminary conclusions. 
uh, because this feels like pretty preliminary work. Um, so this usability of block-based interfaces is higher. Um, and there are no immediate benefits in terms of the choice process and the outcomes, um, mostly the ease of use or the usability. But this may depend on what we did here. Um, because obviously, uh, the personalization was hardly any there. So compared to other studies, we didn't really personalize that much. Um, there's also preliminary confusion on my end. Uh, because the findings of these multi-list papers are so inconsistent in some areas. Um, so we do find advantages with regards to usability, but when it comes to choice overload, it varies quite a lot from study to study. Uh, and I'm uh, really wondering like, okay, what should we do to assess what their effect is on these evaluation aspects? Um, is the domain dependence so important or where could this be uh, due to? And I, I don't know yet. What I do know is what I want to do next with this, um, because there's plenty to improve. Um, we can use this setup where we test different UIs uh, with this current ter terminology that we see here, which is then slightly different from other studies, but introduce better personalization. Uh, there is fair, and we should know more about the choice process, uh, also where people look at. And um, in this study, we didn't really care about which recipe they chose. Could be, of course, that in certain interfaces, for example, the single list, people will just stick to the top five recipes because it's so effortful to scroll down, for example. And a more representative sample is warranted. And in the case of recipes, more dietary context, of course. Um, so my goal would be uh, with research like this to infer uh, a path model uh, in line with uh, the user experience framework uh, where I would be able to link objective changes in the UIs to interaction aspects and evaluation aspects. So that is what I wanted to tell to you. Um, I'm looking for a new job in the Netherlands. So that's just the PR on my end. But besides that, I would love to chat more about this. And this is how you can contact me. So. Thanks for listening and uh, I'll happily take some questions. Thanks, Alain. We have some time for questions from the audience or also from online participants. Okay, uh, there is a question by Jürgen Ziegler. Uh, I can read it, Alan, if you like. Alan, um, oh, yeah, I, I do see it, but uh, yeah, no, uh, go ahead. <laughs> I will read it. In multi list user interfaces, the list labels also provide a semantic organization which is not present in single lists or grids. Is it more the layout or the organization that makes multi lists? popular and usable? Yeah, uh, thanks for that question, Jürgen. Um, yeah, I would definitely think that the semantic aspect makes them so popular. And um, I think that, that maybe the advantage lie them will lie mostly in what I didn't look at here. And that's the, the process of choosing uh, that, for example, discounting specific uh, sublists in such a multi-list interface is much easier if you have like this a semantic heuristic that describes whatever is in this uh, separate list. Um, and perhaps because the in the study that I did here, there were uh, like 40 options, maybe let's say the, the overload aspect wasn't high enough when it comes to, if we compare it to a lot of the popular platforms out there. Um, so I like what you suggest here. And I think that's definitely, uh, I think we should specifically ask for that next time. We have time for another question. I have one. Oh, okay, Martin. Please. Yeah. So you're yeah. having my favorite subject, of course, of answer. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I was wondering, did you find any correlation between the stuff you measure? So you didn't build a, a path model or some model here, right? Uh, no, I didn't in, uh, in this case, no, no. Um, um, 
now what i did find was that uh I, I couldn't really put it together in a part model because of i guess the participants number of participants so the the separate aspects were uh measured quite reliably but making a part model was too much um but what i do uh, i did run regressions so more like the separate uh, type of mediation uh, approach uh and their perceived ease of use did strongly relate to uh, choice difficulty uh but a bit less so to choice satisfaction um so perhaps that let's say the the frustration aspect does manifest itself strongly but maybe not so much the uh let's say the positive effects uh when it comes to relating ease of use to difficulty um but yeah i think the study was a bit too simple to warrant a good uh, bad model here so you, so you have 40 items there in the, in the interface you said 40 yeah up. I'm very afraid of blues or not. So it wasn't hard to choose whether it was blues or not. I think that's uh, they were all uh, vegetarian recipes. So uh, in that sense, they were somewhat similar. Uh, and there were some there were some different categories uh, that we then, of course, noted in the multi list. Um, but yeah, they let's say vegetarian recipes are quite a subset. So um, I think they were also all dinner recipes. So uh, I haven't computed actually how similar they were. Maybe that would be a good step to just check uh, how bad the uh, intersimilarity was. Okay. Uh, so then, do you expect to find different results in a personalized setting? Maybe with uh, also the possibilities for users to issue queries before finding uh, the results? um yeah i think i think it definitely would matter uh possibly also because um let's it depends maybe a bit on the decision uh, strategy that a person would have but if if uh, your interface is personalized and you and you just want in the case of recipes just something that you want to eat that satisfies your needs then it might be easier to just pick any recipe that does so and uh, maybe the odds are higher for personalization uh, on the other hand, I can imagine that with personalization, the, the, the content may become even more similar. So that might also reinforce some decision difficulty. Um, but that might strongly depend on the domain. You know, if uh, if you don't really care which specific recipe, then it is an advantage. But if you're like, oh, I'm looking for this one special thing that I want to cook for uh, whoever, then it might make it also a bit more difficult. Okay. There is a question from chat. Uh, what are some design recommendations you could make for user interfaces in general? Like drop downs are bad for choice making. Um, no, that's a good question. Um, I think for what we are doing as recommended system designers, uh, the total choice set also plays a big role here because I think you might want to uh, if there are just 100 things to choose from, uh, drop downs might still be disadvantage, but uh, the, let's say, the cost of setting up a multi-list might be relatively high for the problem that you're facing. Whereas we couldn't, of course, imagine that uh, Disney Plus or Netflix would have a drop down menu with all of these options um, nowadays, now that we have seen this interface. So, um, but I think in general, this categorization works quite well, but I'm just looking for uh, more evaluative uh, evidence that people actually prefer it and yeah, where it boils down to. Thank you. So let's thank again uh, the speaker and uh, we can move to the second presentation of this session. Yeah. Psychological user characteristics and meta intents in a conversational product advisor. And the presenter is Yuan Ma. Uh, hello, everyone. Can you see my screen right now? Uh, no. You no. Share the screen. Yeah. Yes. How about now? Now it works? Now it works. Yes. We okay. Can. Yeah. Hello everyone, um, I'm Yuan. Today I'm going to present our paper, Psychological Characteristic. Uh, 
psychological user characteristic and meta intense in a conversational product advisor, which cooperate with Tim Klima and Professor Ziegler. Um, this presentation consists of four parts. The first is the introduction of the conversational product advisor or CPA and relevant challenges. The second is about the meta intense. That is the concept what we develop to improve the CPA, especially in user interaction aspect. Third is the experiment part, which include uh, experiment setting, procedures, and uh, results. Last is the limitation and the future work. A conversational recommender system has been gaining increased attention in recent uh, years in research and uh, industry. Conversational techniques can be distinguished between um, natural language-based, form-based, and the critiquing approaches due to the considerable development of the NLP techniques, the NLP-based CRS has become the mainstream of the CRS. However, because of the high reliability and the stability, the form-based CRS or the conventional uh, conversational product advisor has been widely used in production. This research focused on the conversational product advisor. So on one hand, a conversational product advisor has a lot of advantages, transparency, explainable, minimize errors, and incorporating with, um, with expert domain knowledge, which lead to a more stable and less frustrating experience, user experience. But on the other hand, the fixed form calls to lack of flexibility and the personality. The right side is a very simple um, example of CPA. Um, for each user, it provides the same questions with the same GUI. Maybe the question pass is different. Um, for, for example, for the first question, it offers the four answers. It depends on which answer the user choose. The second question will appear. If I choose answer A, maybe the second uh, if I choose an answer one, maybe the question A will appear um, for, if I choose the answer four, then another question will appear. So the only difference is the question pass, but the question content and the answers, options, and the relevant GUI widgets are completely same, are completely identical. However, um, the different users should have different preference. For example, in the level of system guiding, should, should the question be technical or usage level? In the smartphone domain, for example, um, the technical level question could be, would you like a smartphone with a high resolution and a high refresh rate screen? For the usage level question could be, do you usually use a smartphone to watch a movie or document? Actually, both question is eliciting the user preference about the screen, but for different people, they should have a different prefer on these questions. Um, also, in the style of system guidance, should the question sequence be long or short? This is also a very popular question in conversational recommender system. Um, Many people, um, many uh, researchers try to use uh, um, algorithm or training a reinforcement learning model to judge, okay, when we ask the questions to do preference elicitation and when we offer a recommendation to the user. Uh, but from our um, opinion, we think this could be one interaction preference. Maybe some user, they like to get a long question sequence Finally, um, they are happy to see the perfect recommendation in the list, but maybe for the, the other people, they don't like to answer so many questions. They just want to see the recommendation list as soon as possible. So we fit this problem as an interaction preference. Um, to solve these challenges, we develop meta intents to describe this kind of the high ups um, high conceptual level preference, interaction preference. 
So CPA could offer user a personalized recommendation via eliciting user product preference through their predefined question flow. However, they may be ignore the user interaction preference and the lack ability to adapt themselves to fit user interaction preference. Um, as we know, the product preference could be highly various in different domains, but the interaction preference should be pretty similar and be able to unify it across different domain and different interactive user interface. For example, I am the person and I like to find a suitable product as soon as possible, rather than explore all the options. Okay, no matter um, I interact with CPA or chatbot or other UI tools, I should have similar or consistent interaction preference. So for this kind of interaction preference, we could summarize it into efficiency orientation. So once we know um, this user's efficiency orientation score, then we can assign a personalized user interface to him. We call this efficiency orientation meta intense factor as it describes the high level preference. We hereby define the meta intense. Meta intense are several factors that reflect the user high abstract level interaction preference. Ideally, they should independent with domain and the user preference about products. So these are meta intense these are meta intense details include eight factors and relevant question items. Note that these questions um, are at an early stage, neither perfect nor final. They are efficiency orientation, diversity orientation, goal focus, openness for guidance, interest in detail, human-like comparison orientation, and scope of choice. We choose this eight dimensions because they present the user general interaction preference or intense when user involved with CPA or other form of the CRS. They are compatible with modern user interface, but not limited to the specific one. Um, as the high level, uh, as the high abstract level intense, they might be affected by the user psychological characteristics. These factors may reflect the user interaction preference in CPA, but how do we utilize them in CPA? We propose a research framework. So this is our research framework. We assume um, the decision making style. Decision making style is one um, popular and famous um, psychological characteristic. Another also famous um, ocean model, Big Five. But uh, in this research, we choose decision making style uh, as a psychological, as a mainly psychological characteristic and traits. Yeah. So we assume decision making style correlated with our proposed. Uh, meta intense and the meta intense also correlated with the user actual interaction behavior the real interaction behavior um, the user interaction behavior be affected by the decision making style and maybe user decision making style could be predicted from the interaction behaviors so we summarize this into three research questions. The first question is, are there correlations between decision making style and the meta intense? Are there correlations between interactive features, decision making style and the meta intense? The third question is, can we predict user decision making style from their interaction data. To study these questions, we conduct an experiment that is based on a real CPA, which is in Metro's domain and in production use. So it can help us to get real user interaction data. 
we totally um, a total of 496 volunteer users joined our experiment. Um, we use the DSS questionnaire to measure user decision making score, and we use customized meta intense questionnaire as um, we have already seen in previous slides. We use this meta intense questionnaires to measure meta intense score. And uh, the website backend will log, will record user interaction data with the CPA. Actually, the process, the experimental procedure is like this. Uh, I'm the user, I go to the website. Uh, there is a CPA, a form-based conversational recognition system. I just answer some question and then we'll get some recommendations and uh, pick uh, my favorite or some product uh, that are fit to, to me. And then we will um, pop, pop up one link. Would you like to join our survey? And uh, if they click yes, we will show the following questionnaires, the DSS questionnaire and our meta intense questionnaire. And then we get uh, the two kinds of data. The first kind is psychological uh, trace data, decision making style and the meta intense. The second is the interaction data, which button they click and which answer they click even the sorting function and the comparison function, we have all the interaction data. But how can we derive the interaction features from this data? First step, we did the feature engineering for the interaction data. And finally, we get 14 features to describe user interaction behavior. Include the duration of the interaction, the entire duration with the the, the CPA and the number of interactions, how many events happened in the entire uh, the entire process with interacting with CPA, the number of clicks out, and so on. Um, note that uh, these fourteen features are designed for our specific PCA, and then we start to do the data analyze. So we first use k-means clustering to divide the participants into two group, rational group and intuitive group. As we can see in the uh, left side, the blue point stands for the rational people, the red uh, point stands for the intuitive people. And uh, we also visualize the two groups meta intention score, meta intense score in the figure, in the right side, in the right side figure. As we can see, um, the orange stands for the rational group, the green stands for the intuitive group, and uh, as we can see, efficiency orientation, interest in details, and the comparison orientation are significant difference between the two group on these factors. Um, because there's a uh, whiskers doesn't have any overlap. We also now take uh, uh, for the openness forgetting factor, there is a small amount overlap. In order to further rigorously verify its significance, we conduct a t-test. But for the previous three um, factors, what we can know is the two group of people, the rational and the intuitive group, they have the significantly different interaction preference. And this is the t-test results. From the t-test results, we can see the efficiency orientation, openness, for guidance, interest in detail, and comparison orientation are significant difference between two groups on these factors with a benjamin hochberg procedure. We noted that um, these four factors are directly or indirectly related to the duration of the interaction behavior. For example, efficiency orientation means user tend to spend less time and the interest in detail would lead to spending more time. Therefore, we motivated to investigate whether rationality and intuitive group people 
spend a significantly different time on CPE process. This is about uh, the interaction um, data. Since the population distribution on the duration feature doesn't fit a normal distribution, we use the U test instead of the T test. The results claim rationality group spend significantly more time in advisors than the participants within the intuitiveness group. This is uh, something important, uh, what we found in this study. Um, to investigate the correlation between decision-making style and meta-intense, we calculate a sphere mass rank correlation between them. We observed the rationality factor highly correlated with the diversity orientation, interested in detail, and the comparison orientation with a positive value, and has a negative correlation with efficiency um, orientation, goal focus, and intuitiveness factors. In contrast, the intuitive factor factors correlated with the interest in detail, comparison orientation, and the rationality factors with a negative value and has a positive correlation with efficiency orientation, openness for guidance, and the goal focus. So we know there is a significant uh, correlation between conventional decision making style and we developed the meta intense, which means our meta intense can be linked with stable decision making style personalities. Afterwards, we calculated the correlation between decision making style, meta intense, and the interaction features. There are few significant correlations can be observed. We can only find the rationality factors has a significant but a small correlation with overall dialogue duration and the web page focus deactivation. We noted that the largest difference in correlation value for feature duration with factors rationality and intuitiveness. We finally try the classification task, use the interaction feature to predict user decision making style, limited by the data size. We choose the traditional machine learning method, uh, machine learning model instead of deep learning model. However, the classification performance is very weak. Our results provide evidence that these meta intents are linked to general decision making style and can thus be instrument in translating the decision making still into more concrete design guidance for CPA. We observed the interesting correlation between these psychological factors. However, there were no significance correlated with most interaction data, expect for the overall duration of the conversation. Um, we also point out some limitations in our work. We have only one CPA which in a single domain, metrics domain, and a few participants to do analyze. There are only um, under 500, and for each participants, we don't have a decent size of interaction data. We just have the short-term interaction are logged. In the future, we want to explore the, the influence of the meta intents in different CRS, in different uh, domain. Thank you for your attention. Any questions are uh, welcome. Oh. So, Peter, please. Uh, thanks for a really interesting presentation. Uh, I, I, want, I wonder a bit about practical outcomes. It, it's a challenging way to classify users uh, in, in personality questionnaires. All of them are challenging, and uh, the one which you presented is not an exception. Uh, it's not realistic to get users before trying to find the right video to, ask, to answer 20 point questionnaires. Right, we get a lot of the work in education and uh, adaptive educational systems. And after answering even five questions, users expect miracles on the system. Oh, now the system knows about them, but miracles never coming. So, how do you think that could be practically applied? Because guessing the personality is, is kind of tough. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I'm not quite sure I, I get your point. Could you maybe speak slowly? So speak your question is about the how can we measure the personality for the user or uh, about practical application of this interesting finding a practice practice yeah to answer 
to find out about user decision making style. Right? Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so it's not mm -hmm. realistic to the real systems, right? What do you think? How we can use in practice the result of yes, the yes. Yeah, I got your point. I think this is a very interesting and a very important question. Is how can we get the this year making still? If we don't have it, actually, we cannot put our funding in the practice, in the production. Actually, what we are trying to do is we could de uh, derive the decision making style from the user interaction behaviors. That is one target of what we are aiming to. To get actually for this survey, we only have very short term interaction behaviors, which cannot uh, present more uh, features to do classification to do the uh, decision making still prediction. We we thought if we have the decent size long term user interaction behavior, maybe we can find something from it. Maybe these some things can help us to do prediction of decision making style. Once we have done that, just image, when you uh, you have some interaction with the website and the website will log the, your interaction data. Afterwards, uh, the website can generate a digital profile for you. Maybe it's a decision making style. And then this, um, this decision making style can help the website to adapt the personalized UI, UI interface to you. This is our um, final goal. But it's very important to get uh, the decision making style from the interaction behaviors. Yeah. There is a question from the chat. There is Barbara. Uh, says he missed one thing. The, mo the model mentioned affect, but he didn't see details of affect in the final variables evaluated or the affect mood emotion model to be considered to study this variable? Um, so the question is about uh, the affect in the final variables. Is uh, it considered? So what effect? Yeah. Are uh, maybe you can read the, in the chat, or I can repeat if you would like. Uh, I just, uh, I cannot find our. Uh, okay. Where so, I... do, do you yes, hear me? Yes, yes, yes Dennis. Yeah. Uh, uh, Johan, thanks for your presentation. So uh, uh -huh. one of the first slides, when you, when you show the block model, you have one arrow pointing uh, in red color saying that you're using affect, you know, affect. So emotion, yes, yes, right? Yeah. But then uh, I was expecting some details of which uh, emotion model. There are many models. There are some music specific models like like gems, which is emotions for classifying or categorizing music. There are other emotion models like like the typical uh, arousal and balance, right? Uh, mm -hmm. But then I. I, I couldn't uh, see the this effect incorporated in the analysis or in the final result. So, you, did you finally use it? Are, are you gonna use it? And, and how how is how are these details on on effect? Ah, oh, okay. Um, currently, um, we just calculated the correlation between the decision making still rational score and the intuitive score with the interactive features. But uh, in our current stage, we didn't uh, find uh, the significant correlation between the decision making st store with our, uh, with the interaction features. Um, I think what you mentioned is the emotion um, feature is also very interesting. But currently, we only have the rational and the intuitive, limited by the short term interaction features. We also didn't find the significantly. Uh, the highly correlation score between decision making style and the interactions, interaction okay. features. Can I say something as a co author yeah. just to, to uh, clear the situation? I think the word effect was meant here how decision style affects the interaction. It's not meant in the sense of mood or emotion. So that's probably a misunderstanding at this point. 
Okay. Let's thank again the speaker. Mm -hmm. And we can go fast to the third presentation. Yeah, the third presentation is the impacts of primacy recency effects on item review sentiment analysis. And the presenter is Tim Gok Tran Tran. Yeah, hello. Um, currently, I cannot share my screen because I'm uh, uh, to stop sharing for the previous presentation. Yeah, sorry. I, I think I get something wrong. Maybe I should uh, leave out and get in again. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So I hope you can see my screen now. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, so if you can switch on the webcam, we can see you. Otherwise, we will not get uh, the image. Yeah. Uh, so I hope you can see me now. Yeah, okay. Um, so hello everyone, um, my name is Thien Ngoc Dang Dung and today I would like to present our work on the impact of a primacy recency effect on item review sentiment analysis. So this is a, a John's work with uh, Professor Alexander Felfenick and our bachelor student Vesnik uh, Jagizi from across University of Technology, Austria. So my presentations, uh, in, in this presentation, uh, basically I would like to first talk about the introduction, the motivation, and also uh, the contribution of our work. And then I'm gonna move to the main part of the presentation where I will present our general idea, uh, the method, and also our um, uh, approach, uh, which we use neural network model uh, taking into account um, kind of uh, cognitive bias. And in this case, we focus on primacy recency effect and analyze how uh, this effect influence on the um, uh, sentiment classification algorithm. And then uh, finally, I will conclude uh, uh, the work and also point out some limitation and discuss some open issue for future work. So, uh, so as you might know, in uh, the, the rapid developments of, of internet and technology has led us to the, the evolution of e-commerce and social network. And in the, uh, through this um, online platform, um, there are plenty of daily life activities can be done and they trigger uh, a huge amount of information that can be shared on the internet. And uh, so one of the uh, information that people can uh, use that can collect uh, in the internet is custom customer reviews where user can figure out if a, spec if a specific item that they want to purchase is good or bad. And in this context is uh, we are also uh, recognize uh, sentiment analysis is a very, uh, very helpful tool to have user cl clarify uh, reviews into positive, negative, uh, or neutral uh, classes or salience. On the other hand, uh, when making decision, uh, user can user behavior can be influenced uh, by uh, some cognitive biases, and uh, so cognitive biases basically are uh, systematic errors uh, in thinking that can occur when people are processing or interpreting information in daily life and therefore uh, impact their decision-making processes. So uh, in this paper, we focus on one um, kind of cognitive biases. Um, it's called primacy recency effect. It's also known as serial position effect uh, that can trigger whenever user uh, is confronted with um, the list of items. So um, unconsciously influenced by primacy recency effect, uh, users tend to recall or to analyze an um, item show at the beginning or at the end of the, the list um, more often than those shows in the middle. And currently there 
quite plenty of, of study uh, that have been done uh, on primacy recency effect, also in in in, um, in psychology and customer uh, customer decision making um, area, and um, also in recommended system. However, we have observed that uh, there's still uh, missing some study that uh, could give in-depth um, analysis about the influence of uh, of primacy primary recency effect on uh, item review sentiment analysis. So in this paper, we, we brief this gap and uh, we uh, try to analyze if, uh, if uh, primacy recency effect could have uh, some influences on the sentiment analysis. So currently there, there are some approaches for sentiment uh, classification, such as lexicon-based approaches, machine learning, deep learning approaches, or some hybrid approaches that combine um, the two mentioned approaches. Uh, so in this paper, we uh, focus on uh, deep learning approach. Uh, in particular, uh, we use a neural network and uh, we take also into account primary recency effect uh, in order to improve the accuracies of uh, classification algorithms. So our contribution uh, of in this paper is all the following. Uh, we analyze the influences of uh, primacy recency effect on, on a neural network. Uh, we run uh, our approach in, in different data set to sufficiently evaluate uh, the classification algorithm accuracy. And finally, we show that uh, primary recency uh, aware neural network could help achieve um, higher classification accuracy compared to the, the basic uh, neural network or the original neural network. Um, so as I mentioned before, so, uh, we focus on a deep learning approach, um, particularly uh, we use bi-directional long short-term memory neural network um, to, to, uh, for sentiment analysis. So the reason why we chose this, um, this approach uh, are the following. Uh, first, because it has been widely used in uh, natural language processing and it has already been uh, effectively apply to sentiment analysis as well. And uh, it's have recognized the relationship between values at the beginning and at the end of the sequence, uh, which is quite close to what we wanted to analyze uh, regarding primary recency effect. And finally, uh, this approach also uh, has sequence inf information in both direction, backward and forward. So our idea in this uh, work um, is to propose an extended version of uh, bi-directional long short-term memory neural network uh, that takes into account primary recency effect. And uh, we also estimate the classification accuracy um, of the, uh, the uh, proposed neural network compared to the, the basic uh, um, neural network. So our method uh, can be summarized as the following. Uh, so with, the, with an entry, so entry in this case is a, a review, and we um, uh, split it into sentences and then take a specific numbers of sentences at the beginning and at the end of the lists um, to create uh, corresponding sublists. Uh, so in this case, if we take the, 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 the sentences in the first, uh, in the beginning of the list, then we have primacy uh, sublists. And at the end of the list, uh, we have recency sublists. And then uh, these uh, lists uh, will be sent to the logic, logistic regression classifier uh, to create a, a logic value. And then we send them to the uh, output of the network. So in order to evaluate or estimate the influences of primacy recency effect, uh, we propose, we develop two uh, neural network models. The first one is just the basic one, um, bi-directional long short-term um, memory uh, neural network uh, consisting of uh, three layers. And the goal of this uh, model is to update the ways of uh, the embedding metric and then pass each of the layer to the, the sigmoid layer. And then we get the probability value uh, that help us to, to predict if the review is negative or positive. 
So if the, uh, the probability value is less than 0 0.5, then it's a negative review. Otherwise, this is a positive review. Uh, for, the, for the primary recency aware neural network, we uh, extend the, the, the original one by adding um, additional input layer where we can see, consider also the, the logic value of primary recency and also addition, uh, addition layer in the, in the, in the, in the, the ends of the uh, model um, that to predict the, the output. So uh, different from the original one, uh, after we get the probability value, we have to invert it to, to a real value in order to add it to the addition uh, layer and then to, uh, reconvert back to the, uh, so, uh, the sigmoid value, uh, which in the, in the range of zero to one, and then we can predict the output. So, um, so as I mentioned before, that our purpose is to compare the difference, uh, sorry, the, the, the performance in terms of uh, classification accuracy between, between the primacy recency aware neural network um, and the uh, original one uh, by using different data sets. So in this study, we use five different data sets uh, where in different uh, item domains. Um, so movie domain and also smartphone, industrial scientific, uh, and also allies. And uh, for further detail uh, of the data set, we have already provided the link uh, that you can find uh, in the slide or in the paper. So some characteristic of the data sets, um, they, are, they are different, uh, they rate and scale in different uh, data sets. So some Amazon data sets, uh, five score rating scale are used. Um, however, in the movie uh, data sets, uh, only two score rating scale is used. Uh, so we had to normalize uh, in order to convert to a standard uh, two score rating scale. And then uh, we use kind of traditional approach for splitting uh, data set um, besides, uh, because the data sets uh, size is pretty large. So we, uh, we cannot take all, the whole data set because of the, limit, uh, the limited um, the, uh, res the device, uh, the computer. And therefore we have to select the subset of the, of the data set. So in this case, we, uh, we select, for instance, uh, five, five, uh, 50,000 sample and uh, equally split between positive and negative entries. And then uh, we run three iteration uh, for, for the random selection and then take the average. Um, so uh, we also do some data set pre-processing. Uh, we use na natural language toolkit tool library to to, to do some uh, typical tasks for, uh, for data set pre-processing like uh, word uh, tokenization, removing stop words, uh, removing links, uh, removing multiple spaces, uh, lowercase words, and simplify words. And then we also do two additional tasks, uh, sequencing uh, that stores all words in the lists and then sequence them into numbers and padding uh, that uh, uh, have the input with the same size. And um, we, um, we run our evaluation in a computer uh, with the configuration with uh, some uh, feature as I uh, as show in the screen. So with the window, education 64 bit uh, RAM with uh, 60 gigabyte and CPU with six cores. And we also chose some parameter uh, that uh, have been proven from the best practice, like a batch size of 228, uh, embedding metric with 300 dimension. And we also take the default uh, regulations value, regu regularization value. So we ran our approach with a different amount of, of, uh, of um, sen sentence we wanted to take from the, the, the beginning and the end of the, of the list. Uh, so in this case, we, we try with three variants, 10%, uh, 20%, and 30%, uh, uh, num like the amount of sentence we wanted to take uh, from the beginning and from the end of the list. So this is uh, uh, the result. So um, from 
from the result, we can see that um, in in all case, in most of the cases, uh, the performance of a primacy recency aware neural network uh, has a better performance in terms of classification uh, accuracy compared to the uh, original one. Uh, however, it shows some differences uh, from different uh, data sets. For instance, in the um, movie data set and also Amazon smartphone, we can observe that uh, if we select only 10% of the sentences for primacy recency uh, sublist, then at some point, um, the, the performance of the, uh, the primacy, primacy recency aware neural network uh, show lower performance compared to the original one. However, if we create, if we increase the numbers of sentences uh, for primacy recency uh, list sublists, then uh, in all cases it show uh, always better performance. So, in this leads to um, a conclusion that uh, the higher the numbers of uh, uh, sentences we take for the primacy uh, list recency sublist, the better performance of the neural network compared to original one. And it's also sh uh, clearly show in the, the remaining data set uh, um, that where the uh, all in all cases um, the um, our neural network um, outperformed the uh, original one. So uh, in conclusion, uh, so in this paper we have proposed an, a neural network of bidirectional long short term memory considering primary recency effect. And we have uh, also estimated the impact of uh, primacy recency effect in different data sets. And we have showed that uh, primary recency effects have uh, positive uh, influences in, uh, senti on sentiment uh, classification. And by considering uh, this effect, uh, it could help increase the performance of, uh, of the neural network. However, uh, our work also shows some, uh, some limitations. Uh, the first one lies in the uh, sentiment classification method, uh, where it's, uh, it depends on the uh, logistic regression classif classifier performance. And it also depends on the, the, uh, the structure of the neural network. So is uh, our neural network pretty uh, simple because it consists uh, not so many, uh, only three layers. And also uh, in the pre-processing, we didn't uh, involve textual spelling correction, which could uh, trigger some noise in the data set. For future work, uh, we um, uh, wanted to um, adopt other sentiment classification approaches, for instance, a lexicon-based approach to provide further analysis results for, uh, for primacy recency effect. And we also plan to implement a neural network model uh, based on the intention mechanism and uh, also adapted for primary recency effect. So basically the attention mechanism is somehow like uh, we just focus on some uh, relevant uh, factors and ignoring the remaining one. So that basically um, uh, our presentation and um, I would like to say thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to answering your questions. Thank you. We have time for some quick questions. I can read one from chat. How primacy recency values are calculated? Did you get the question? Uh, yes. Um, how primary recency can be calculated? Um, so we uh, we add. We add uh, so here. I can show again the slide. Uh, can you see the screen again? Sorry. Yes. yes. Okay. So this is uh, um, the uh, our neural network where we. Um, so we would take the from the list of uh, of maybe this one is better. So this we take the uh, the lists of uh, in the list of sentences of the each uh, reviewer uh, review. Then uh, we take uh, 
a uh, specific number, for instance, ten percent of the uh, the sentences in the in the beginning of the list, and also um, the same amount of questions uh, sentences in the in the end, and then we create some uh, two corresponding sublist, and then we uh, um, send it to the to the uh, logistic regression classifier, and then from this it can generate some a uh, logic value. And this could be sent to the uh, the additional um, addition layer where we could uh, where we could uh, calculate uh, the output. So this is uh, we we send it to the uh, this the network and train it and and calculate it. Okay. Uh, please please more time. Yeah. Yeah, I was <laughs> reading that. Thanks, great, great talk. So, uh, privacy and VC effects are originally for memory effects. Um, in your case, so so what you're basically doing is you're giving more weight to the first and the last part of the review, right? Yes. So, is that because people Process that information different, or is it because alters puts the more important stuff at the beginning or the end? Because I always train my students: if you write something, that start with the conclusion or start with a good sort of point. So might it also be that there's just more information given by the review writer at the in the beginning and the end of the the review, rather than the person processing that information easier. Um, I'm not sure if I get the whole question because some some betweens I cannot hear it clearly because of maybe because of connection. Um, can you just uh, repeat your questions and at the end I, I cannot get it. Okay, so let's try again. So is it uh, that people process the information that is first and last easier, or is it because reviewers actually write reviews that have the more important information at the beginning at the end than at the end um so this is the idea basically come from the what you have mentioned because some plenty of study have uh, proven that users tend to uh analyze this the information show at the beginning at at the end of the of the list, uh, more more often than those in the middle. So based on this idea, we also we was uh, assume that if we if we take um, only the question the, the the information from the uh, from the beginning at, at the end, and we can see if those information could have somehow increased the classification um, accuracy or not. So that this is basically the idea. Uh, Lead up to to this uh, study, and uh, we we have proved we have proven in our evaluation result that okay, if some information in the beginning and at the end uh, could have to uh, increase the classification uh, accuracy, and yeah, so so it's um, yeah, that's that's the uh, the result that we could observe. Okay, there is a, another question from the chat is why not to use positions of items directly instead of mapping it to primacy presency. Yeah, so this is a uh, very good point. We also also think about this uh, for the future work. Uh, if I, uh, so it's not only the 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 uh, uh, the sentences in each review, but also the the item uh, in the list, also the position of item in the list of reviews also play a role. Um, I mean, it can, can also uh, another primary recency effect that we we wanted to analyze to, in the future. But this is uh, yeah, it's not uh, what we have done in this study. There is a question from Dennis, please. Yeah, uh, do you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, uh, thank you for the talk. I, I was wondering about uh, pre-training. Did you train from scratch this uh, network or you had a pre-trained network? Mm -hmm. 
So um, you, you started with uh, with random initialization of the weights, or it, it already had, let's say, weights from, uh, I don't know, pre-trained uh, LSTM from, from another language model network. You, you know what I mean? Um, this is uh, kind of pre-trained because we pre-trained pre network and then we try to uh, adapt the weight. Ah, okay, yeah. Yeah, because uh, yeah. sometimes the pre-training influences the result too. So that's something that, that you, can, you can look at. And mm -hmm. one, one thing I, I was wondering, because um, the, the way that you are um, addressing this problem, it might be also possible to do it in a different way. So you can, uh, for example, use the, the primacy or recency as an auxiliary task. Let's say that with your LSTM, you try to predict the, the typical, your task, right? Uh, sentence classification positive, negative, yeah. whatever. But maybe mm -hmm. you can you can have a pre-trained network and you can add a loss, which is if you are able to predict if the sentence that you are giving as an input is uh, is in the beginning or at the end, so it has prim uh, primacy or recency. So you can uh, usually uh, in, in computer vision, it's very popular to, to have auxiliary tasks. To, so to teach the network, to, to learn other things that could be useful for your task. And, and maybe that's another way that you can address this particular problem. So to know that uh, if uh, letting this network learn about, about primacy and recency also help to, to, to learn a representation that helps you on the, on the final interesting task in your case, which is sentiment. And, and that could be also a way to, to analyze it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's, that's very good um, feedback and uh, we will consider it um, yeah. and improve it. Yeah, thank you very much. And, uh, nice talk, thank you. Okay, let's thank again the presenter and So the last presentation is serendipity in recommender systems beyond the algorithms, a feature repository and experimental design. And the presenter is Annalyn Smith, please. Um, could someone maybe help me to put on the presentation? Um, in the meantime, I will already start by introducing myself and my co-authors. So I'm Annalyn um, and I, collaborated on this uh, work together with Lynn Hills and Tuan Bovers, who are also here, uh, and uh, Lennart Bjorneborn. Um, and it was actually quite funny to see that the author transcript uh, put some asterisks when the word serendipity was uh, mentioned. I think that's quite fittingly, um, because let's start with addressing the elephant in the room. What is serendipity? Um, I think if I would ask each and every one of you to give me an example or your definition, it will be very different. Um, and that ex that's also actually a kind of the main point of, of our, or this talk, or what I want you to take away from when you walk out, is that serendipity is actually a user experience. Um, what we did, or, or where our, our view on serendipity comes from is actually from work beyond the recommender systems uh, literature. Um, and when you look at how others study serendipity, they approach it as a user experience. And it's really something that users experience when they interact with an environment um, and they encounter something that they did not expect or that they were not really planning to uh, encounter. Um, so when you think of serendipity as a user experience, that's actually very different from how uh, most of the recommender systems literature is dealing with serendipity. Uh, because most of the time it's considered as one of these beyond accuracy metrics like diversity and novelty and, and coverage. Um, that's and I'm not a computer scientist, but as far as I can tell, um, you can calculate it and it's quite um, 
descriptive and and it's it's basically almost like a fact well actually serendipity evolves very different in different contexts sometimes you're open to experiencing serendipity so you may experience serendipity other times um, users don't want any serendipity at all because they just they know what they're looking for and they want to find it um, and that's a bit why we think this idea of serendipity as a beyond accuracy metric is simply too narrow and is actually also hindering us in uh, facilitating serendipity recommender systems. The second point that I think that the audience here uh, is quite uh, yeah, will agree with me on that point um, is that um, serendipity is not only uh, to be or is cannot only be facilitated by only focusing on algorithms. Um, that's also why we argue to go beyond the algorithm. Um, most of the prior work in serendipity uh, in recommender systems focused on algorithms to make recommendations more serendipitous. Um, but we would say that there is way more uh, on how you can uh, facilitate serendipity. So we question the current uh, way of looking at serendipity. And when you think of serendipity as an experience, you might um, think of it actually as an outcome of a user interacting with an environment. Um, and for those of you who are maybe familiar with the term affordances, this may look uh, very um, recognizable um, because actually this relationship between users, environments and the outcome is what is captured in this idea of affordances, um, which also signals that um, it's conditional or yeah, it you cannot guarantee it because there is also some kind of uncertainty. Um, you can try to design your environment in such a way that it facilitates a particular outcome, but if your user comes to this environment with a different intent or with um, a different mindset or with, with in, in a different context, it's not guaranteed that this outcome will be uh, realized. Um, a typical example of an affordance is a door handle. Um, a door handle is, is a feature of an environment and it allows you to open a door, which is the outcome, and most users are able to, to do so. Um, but imagine that there is a child who is not able to reach the handle, then the outcome is not guaranteed. So this idea of affordances is a way to deal with the uncertainty that relates to the, um, to the experience. And that is also how other researchers have been studying serendipity and uh, more relevant to, to, to our discussion here is also how we can design for serendipity. And there is this idea of affordances um, has been applied in, in a lot of other uh, research domains. Um, and that's also why we talk about affordance features, which are actually the features of the environment, in this case, or recommender system, that are assumed to facilitate uh, experiences of serendipity. So you can design for serendipity by trying to design the right affordance features. And as I said, um, this idea of affordance features and how you can design for serendipity has been studied in uh, a lot of contexts. Um, most popular are libraries and bookshops, uh, but also in cities, it's, um, you can find it. Um, for example, in uh, libraries and bookstores, it has been found that when you show the covers of the items, people are more likely to do these um, unplanned discoveries um, instead of when you just show the spine of the books, which is often the case. Um, so this uh, example here is a, a library in London that is explicitly designed to uh, foster serendipity. Um, you also see that in the back there are some chairs, which is also found to be um, a way to help people to slow down and get them a bit in the right mood to start uh, exploring. And you see a very similar thing happening in cities where um, this idea of, of spontaneous encounters, unplanned encounters are also very much appreciated. And uh, this is a picture of Melbourne that has been um, many times 
uh, uh, acclaimed to be the most uh, livable city in the world. And there uh, you also find a lot of places where people can sit down and uh, start to uh, wander. So uh, our co-author, Lena Bornborn, has um, studied all of these um, affordance features, and he classified them into three high-level um, yeah, let's say design principles that can help you to design environments to uh, foster serendipity and he classifies them as diversifiability, traversability, and sensorability. There is more um, details on that in our paper. Um, so but it's basically about how uh, the diverse the environment is, how easy it is to traverse it, and um, how uh, users can uh, perceive it with their uh, senses. And actually, based on all, all, all these findings and everything that is already known from different domains, we actually were thinking that, okay, how can we translate these insights into recommender systems? Are there similar mechanisms that we can apply? So that's what we did. Um, we looked at a lot of uh, recommender system interfaces and really based on what uh, we know, what we learned from uh, related work, we tried to um, identify the different elements of uh, recommender systems interfaces and um, thought like, okay, this looks a lot like uh, other principles that we see in other environments. Um, so that has been a very um, big exercise. Um, and we tried to uh, classify everything that we found in uh, this feature repository. Um, and we categorized it in, in three main categories. Um, basically, actually, with the, the, the goal of trying to have um, some kind of systematic overview, if that's ever possible, um, where we can um, look for and see, okay, um, and also related to um, other research that has been done in the previous presentations, also in the keynote this morning, there, are, there was a lot of things that actually also talk about explorability, um, helping people to discover other things. And our goal with this uh, repository is actually to provide uh, a means to somehow um, inventory, inventorize the related work and uh, give a sort of a toolbox for those who want to make their recommender systems um, trigger experience of serendipity um, to basically inspire them and think of, okay, how can we um, rely on related work and, and translate this to our own work? I will, I will give three very quick examples uh, to give you an idea of what this could be. Um, for example, the use of uh, user-generated content. Um, ideally, um, if you would be able to in incorporate it in the, in the recommender system and uh, hopefully uh, take it into account in the recommendations that you do, um, but maybe also the possibility of showing user-generated content, um, for example, by showing the reviews, this might also invite users to um, explore the item because maybe what someone else said in, in their review about, about the book, for example, might trigger something that um, invites them to explore the item. Um, in, the, in the presentation of uh, Alain earlier, um, we saw what, what happens when you uh, represent items uh, in, in different lists um, based on what we see in, in other domains related to serendipity. We think that it might also be very worthwhile to, this, to uh, study what these different user interface elements and the representation, um, what kind of effect this has on how users experience serendipity. Um, the same goes for, uh, for example, the use of personalized or non-personalized uh, recommendations. Um, there, an interesting point is, for example, the use of um, popular uh, recommendations. Um, you could think that um, this is actually an interesting one because showing popular items might maybe uh, inhibit serendipity because when you show it uh, on the first um, 
screen that, that the user see, they may directly go for it and because it, it triggers their attention and it's, it's, it might also be why they were coming to the, um, to the, to the interface. For example, if it's a news uh, website, they might indeed be looking for this trending news article. Um, but perhaps if we um, don't show the popular items on the first screen that they see, but we put it a bit lower below the fold, we might um, invite them to explore more of the um, of the other items because they are looking for this uh, popular uh, item. Um, so, but this is actually all very uh, hypothetical because at this point uh, we don't know. Um, but also based on, on the previous uh, presentations, I think there is so much um, to explore that really goes beyond uh, the algorithm. So our, our work is mainly a call for uh, looking beyond uh, the algorithms and then experimenting with other features. And of course, experimenting and understanding serendipity as a user experience also calls for uh, user studies and, and uh, experiments that involve users. Um, and there we uh, think the user-centric evaluation framework provides actually a great um, starting point to think of this kind of experiments where actually uh, serendipity is an experience, as you know by now, and the affordance features that we listed and, and we can think of many more um, relate to these uh, objective system uh, aspects. And then in, in the, the work uh, on the framework, um, we can use that as a, as a starting point to start designing and conducting uh, experiments where we try to assess the impact of the affordance features on the um, experiences of serendipity. And uh, we can take into account all the personal characteristics uh, because it has been found that some people are just more open to experience new things. Some, some people are, are less likely uh, to do so, uh, but also the context uh, plays a big role. Um, for example, if you really are looking for something, you actually don't want uh, to experience a lot of serendipity, but if you are, um, if for example, if you want to watch a movie and you have a lot of time and you want to browse through the, the catalog, perhaps you are more um, open to experience serendipity at that point. Um, in our um, paper, we describe just one of the many possible uh, scenarios that can be used in such an experiment. Um, for example, if we want to study the impact of showing the book covers, just as in the library, uh, compared to not showing the covers, um, we could think of a scenario where we invite uh, participants to find books for a monthly book uh, club. Um, and we tell them, okay, this is, this is a topic of the, of the next book uh, club meeting, but if you come across um, some books that are interesting to you, you can put them on your uh, personal list and we will send it to you afterwards. Um, this is a, a similar research design that has been used in other uh, studies on serendipity. And then the serendipity outlines would be those on the personal uh, favorite lists. Um, and, and this is one of the scenarios that we would like to, um, to study. Of course, we need to, uh, we need to think of an of a, of a experimentation environment where we can, can do so, uh, of course. So I hope that um, you still remember that we think that serendipity should be studied as user experience and that it's very worthwhile to uh, look at affordance features that go beyond the algorithm. Um, and as I, you may often, uh, serendipity is often used as a means or used in combination with bursting filter bubbles. Um, so if you want also know something about uh, filter bubbles, I can highly recommend the uh, fact track session tomorrow where uh, Dean will also share um, some work on uh, filter bubbles. Thank you.
for a very quick question. <laughs> Uh, I have one. Uh, in uh, your table of uh, features, uh, can you distinguish between domain specific features and general general purpose features? I mean, uh, how many of those features are dependent on the application domain that you consider? Yeah, I think um, that's also part of understanding serendipity as an experience. They're all uh, domain specific. Um, I think serendipity in news is very different than serendipity in a movie streaming platform. Um, so that's why we need these experiments to find out um, if uh, including uh, explanations, for example, works to foster serendipity in this context, and if it has a, a similar uh, effect in, in another context. Um, I think my, my assumption would be that it's it's all, um, yeah, different, um, but we need um, to do an experiment because we don't know yet. Oh. Um, can you please kind of elaborate a bit whether uh, uh, serendipity is uh, related to user engagement somehow or whether it's uh, a synonym? That's a good question. Um, I think that um, serendipity can be related to user engagement. So we can try to um, foster experiences of serendipity as a means to engage your user more. Um, but it, it's not always the case because uh, when your user is looking for a very specific item and, and they know it up front, it might be, um, yeah, inhibit uh, or be negative, uh, negatively influencing the engagement because they don't want it at that point. Um, but I think what we need to do is um, not just throw serendipity everywhere, uh, but really think very clearly about why we are designing for serendipity and with what intent we want to, um, to design for serendipity. Is it to increase engagement? Is it to fight filter bubbles? Is it to uh, address more items in more long tail? I think also these intents, design intents, also um, have a big impact on how we should design for serendipity and how it is experienced by uh, users. But unfortunately, that's uh, not part of this talk, but it's part of my PhD research. So I'm happy to talk more of it uh, afterwards. Thanks very much for the great talk. Um, so there's not this much research on serendipity. And while looking at that, I found that uh, sometimes there's not even an agreement for what of the definition of serendipity. So the um, common one is an item is serendipitous if it's uh, unexpected, normal, and relevant. Uh, do you agree with this definition in your view? Um, yes and no. <laughs> um, I think um, I, will, I will briefly recap my uh, PhD where I speak of uh, intended serendipity, which is the intent of the designer to foster serendipity, afforded serendipity, how you design for it, and experience serendipity. And I think um, making recommendations diverse, relevant, unexpected is indeed a way to trigger uh, serendipity, but it's not at all the only way. Um, I, there is this, uh, it's a famous bookshop in Japan where there is only one book in the shop. So every week there is another book. Um, it's for many people, they say it's, it's, uh, it's uh, the example of serendipity. But there is actually no diversity at all. Um, so I really think that we, we should think of serendipity from, as I said, from what is it that we want to do with it? And then think, OK, how do we translate this into something that we can design for and uh, operationalize? So I, I don't think that it's only 
and those unexpected things are relevant. Uh, are there benchmark data sets of testing the ability of algorithms to achieve serendipity? Now I'm looking at uh, some more experience. I think there are some, um, there is some work, for example, by Ben Spotov, who also did a PhD on serendipity in recommender systems, and he has um, he has a, a data set as far as I know, but I'm a communication scientist, so I uh, I will pull that part here, but I think the work of Dennis Kotkov is something to, uh, to look into if you're looking for it. Hey, I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear the name correctly. Could you please type it down? Um, uh, thank, thank you so much for the presentation. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, so this concludes the session. Let's thank again all the presenters and all the The next session will be at two o'clock.
Okay. Okay. Prime trauma. Yes, the the sound is arriving there, but there is this yes. very bad noise. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Proa, no? Good. Yes. Perfect. Okay. Check one, two.
Yeah, yeah. Can start since we have some people online. So welcome back. Hope you enjoyed the lunch and uh, perhaps a, a, talk, uh, a walk uh, outside the conference hotel. So welcome to the second session of the workshop. This session is uh, about preference solicitation and explanation. And we have uh, three papers. Uh, all the presentation will be uh, online. I remind the authors that uh, they have uh, 20 minutes, uh, including uh, time for questions. So we can start with the first speaker, uh, which is uh, Ayub El Mahodi. And uh, it is going to present the paper Boosting Health, examine the role of nutrition labels and preference elicitation methods in food recommendation. You should be able to share the screen. Yes. Can you see my screen? Yeah, but yeah. Okay. okay. It is in a presenter view. Can I start, please? You can start. All right. Okay, thank you very much. So this is Ayub, and I'm going to talk about Boston Health, examining the role of nutrition labels and preference elicitation method in food recommendations. This work is together with my supervisors, Alan Stark and Christoph Ratner. And uh, throughout this uh, presentation, I will, I will take you through motivation behind this work and the proposed solution. Then I will discuss the research questions that we are tackling in this research, followed by the methodology to answer the research question. And at the end, I will discuss the experimental result of our experiment. So, so this work is uh, uh, discussing two dimensions. The first one, we will discuss how we can help people to choose more healthy food options when they are in front of a food recommender system. And in the other hand, we want to evaluate or to examine to what extent preference elicitation method can help people to evaluate food recommender system in a better way. So here we have health or food knowledge affects the outcome beyond the algorithm accuracy. So how the, the, the recipes presented to users affect the, the, I mean, the choice satisfaction of the users and how people interact with, this, with the system. So for the... Excuse me. Uh, we saw the we see the presentation with the notes. You should switch switch the screen, please. Okay. Good. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. All right, so for the, for the first problem that we are tackling in this research, so imagine that people, they want to, to go to a food recommender system and then they want to prepare a, a specific recipe. But the problem in this in those, in those food recommender system is the lack of nutritional information. And even people, if they want to go to evaluate a specific recipe, they have to go to, to, another, to another link to show all those information. And once those information are presented, not general public can evaluate those information as they are presented in a detailed way and not all people they have, I mean, the requirements to, to know e exactly to what extent this recipe is healthy and the other one is not. 
That's in the one hand. On the other hand, several studies, one of them is by Tratner and Dinsweiler, they found that all line recipes, I mean, all online recipes that are out there, they are not healthier. So less than 5% of online recipes adhere to all healthy nutritional guidelines of some, some, some scores like FSA score and WHO score. So as those algorithms are trained on unhealthy recipes, so obviously they produce unhealthy recommendations. And even some of them, they try to improve the healthiness of the recommended recipes, but there is some trade-off. For example, the random alg algorithm recommends health healthiest options, but with some trade-off. And those trade-off are lower accuracy, but increased, increased the healthiness. And here, here there is a problem of to what extent these randomness can personalize better to a user and then maintain the, the healthiness of, of the given uh, recipes. This is in the one hand. So in the other hand, as it's uh, described by the keynote speaker, Dennis, that there is a, 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 a huge contribution to how how uh, how the system elicits preferences from the users leads to a better satisfaction or to a worse satisfaction of, of the users. For example, a work by Kainberg and Williamson, they found that attribute based leads to higher satisfaction if users have higher knowledge. So there is a, a trade-off between the knowledge and the, the the preference elicitation method used in the system, and this is an example of of uh, the finding of uh, Kernberg and Williamson. So the proposed solution is that we want to maintain personalization and boost nutrition labels. So we want to improve the accuracy of the algorithms, and in the same time help people to judge presented recipes and choose more healthy options. We choose those those uh, pre, those labels because they capture consumer attention, are easier to process, and at the end they influence the consumer decision. So, in the second hand, we see that there is a huge relation between the preference elicitation elicitation method and the user knowledge and the user experience. So, tailored preference elicitation method contributes to the user satisfaction. And in our in our case, we evaluate two preference elicitation method, the constraint constant based and rating based preference elicitation method and in terms of of the of user knowledge we evaluate the knowledge of user through health consciousness that is some pre validated questionnaire that used in in the fourth domain and for the user experience we evaluate perceived effort choice satisfaction and choice difficulty and to tackle this research this research we presented through uh, through two research questions the first one is to what extent does a nutrition labor boost steer user towards healthy recipe choice in a recommender system context. The second research question is to what extent does a user evaluation of a food recommender system depend on the interplay between a user health consciousness and the system's preference elicitation method. So the methodology to solve this research question, first we did an offline evaluation of several uh, food recommend of several algorithms to see which one are better to, to be integrated in our online experiment. And the second is through an online experiments in which you evaluate our system through user centric evaluation. So for the offline evaluation, we choose data sets from all recipes, and then we evaluated several algorithms. And at the end, we come up that singular value decomposition is the best one in terms of collaborative filtering. And for the for the for the experimental design, we designed a system in which users can give their preferences. First, they started by giving some personal information and then the health consciousness. And in terms of uh, rating based, they choose which which food category they want uh, the recipes to be presented in. And then they write some, uh, give writing to some to some recipes. And then we give some boosts that uh, is just supporting the user to choose uh, to 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 evaluate the, the labels. And for 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 the second condition is recipe future in which we ask users to give some some uh, some values to a specific futures. And for those futures, are, they are presented here. So, for example, we ask the user which what category they want, and then the recipe is based on some writings, and then the preferred number of servings, the preferred amount of of calories, the time available for cooking, and the preferred number of ingredients. And the system uses those 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 futures to find the similar futures or the most relevant futures for users. And for the the second condition in which we develop another system in which user can give writing to a specific recipe and the system use its videos we found in offline evaluation to produce or to generate more personalized 
recipes based on those writings. For the BOST, we educate people about food nutrition labels by just mentioning this is what every color in the label meaning. For example, if this series red means the product is high in nutrition, umber means the medium, and the green means low. So the more green light lights a label show, the healthier the food is. And after that, this is what the user saw in terms of, of recommendations for in the, in, the, in the baseline condition, they saw uh, a recipe without labels. And in the in the control condition, the CR recipe annotated with multiple traffic like labeling. So, for our first research question, we found that Boston multiple tra traffic light labeling system labels leads to a significant healthy choice in both different preference elicitation methods. So, regarding the type of preference elicitation, when we boast or when we help people to understand. What is the meaning of specific label? Does lead lead people to choose more healthy options, both in in constraint based and also in in the under in the other condition? For the the second resource question, so well, uh, that is in which we want to evaluate the how there is the interplay between knowledge of people and the preference elicitation method. So well. We found actually that there is an interaction effect between preference elicitation method and the level of knowledge. But if you unspeak the figure, you can see that the effect is strongly shown in the constraint based preference elicitation. But in the collaborative filtering, the effect is not, is not that high. So the conclusion is that in terms of the user perception, users with low level of health consciousness perceive the constraint based to be less effortful. So as much as the, the user knows about the, as much as the user knows about the healthiness as much it will it, the system needs more effort from them to uh, give recommendations and also to elicitate the preferences for the the second uh, dimension of our second research question so in terms of use of choice satisfaction and choice difficulty so constraint based to found to be more difficult and less satisfactory so as, as we can see here in those figures. So in terms of constraint based, the, the level of satisfaction is really is really low. And in terms of, of uh, in terms of collaborative filtering, the, the satisfaction is high. So both constraint based leads to, to lower, uh, lower satisfaction and high difficulty. So in terms of, of, of the main takeaways from this research, so Boosting as educational support of users can lead to change in behavior and leads to more healthy choices. The second dimension, so user experience of a food recommender system is significantly associated with the user preference elicitation method and level of user knowledge. So here the user knowledge is evaluated in terms of health consciousness. So less experienced user found constraint based to be less effortful. Of course, there is some limitations in, in our work. One of them is results of preference elicitation method was opposite of the, the work that we used to produce our work, that is by Karen Burke and A. Williamson, as least experienced the user like a future based preference elicitation. So one of the explanations is maybe recipe futures that we used is in 20, intuitive why writing the recipe is not. So the other limitation is constraint based method performed poorly as the way we 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 designed the futures is based what on what we find in our data set so we are thinking to replace knowledge based to use a knowledge based method based on some work by cataldo mosto and others so the 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 third limitation is that health consciousness construct did not fit very well so we are thinking to use more uh, food knowledge or replace it with domain knowledge constraint so that's it in my side and uh, thank you very much for your attention and please if you want the details you can just scan the, the qr of our paper thank you any question from the audience uh, no uh, there was a question uh, uh, online uh, even though Helen Stark has uh, answered to the question, but maybe it could be useful to say something. So, uh, which recipe and user interaction data set did you use to perform the offline evaluation? 
Uh, we know that is uh, the all recipe.com data set, but maybe you can add something in order to give more information to the audience. Yes, of course. So the data set that we use is all, re all recipe data set. So basically this data set is contained almost 600,000 recipes written by 58,000 users. But we didn't use all this data set because some, some, rec some recipes from this data set there is a missing of some metadata about it. So we just used almost 900, 900 recipes to, to perform offline evaluation. Okay, so there is a question. Uh, so I have a brief question. Uh, so is it healthy or green? You say that in your case, healthy was shown as green. Maybe people just like to do green. Let's say you go another uh, control variable, like the amount of magnesium in food. There is no good or bad here, right? And randomly choose good or green or red. So what will be the result? Just I wonder to what extent is the understanding what is healthy or just following the color? What do you think? Okay. So, I mean, as as uh, I'm not actually a nutritionist, but as I understand those those uh, those rec how those recipes are evaluated in terms of health, as you can see here, just to mention this, as you can see here, this is how we produce a label for specific uh, specific recipe. So based on this, on, on the multiple traffic light that is produced by UK st Standard Agency of Food. So we compute fat in a specific recipe, saturated fat, sugar, salt, and then we have a threshold. So if, because if it's a, this score is produced from four to, to 12, so it's, if it's from four to eight, it's, look, we consider it healthy. And if, if it's more than eight, we consider it unhealthy, unhealthy recipe. And then we produce the, the, the label for a specific recipe. So we didn't go in detail to what extent specific recipe in our recipe is, is really healthier. So we just produce the label for a recipe and based on that, if it's a score that is, I mean, it's evaluated several years and they say, this is what, what, we, what, what it means. Okay, thank you. Any other question? No? Okay, thanks again, the speaker. And stop sharing your screen. And uh, we can proceed with the second talk. Uh, the title of the paper is Explainable Robot Advisors, Empirical Investigation to Specify and Evaluate a User-Centric Taxonomy of Explanation in the Financial Domain. And the speaker is uh, Sidra Navid. So can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. So good afternoon to all who are currently in Seattle. It is almost 11.30 p.m. in Germany and already past my bedtime, but I'm happy to be able to present my work virtually today. So let's get started. We have seen in the past few years that recommender systems have been widely used and applied in various financial services domains such as online banking, loans, stocks, asset allocations, and portfolio management. But financial domain has a number of peculiarities as compared to other domains such as movie or song recommendations. And the two most um, reasons for this are that the finance world is complex and risk involved in financial decisions is high. An unsuitable movie recommendation might be wastage of time or bothersome, but a wrong financial decision could have a dramatic impact on the life of a financial investor. Another reason is that financial literacy of common user might be quite low, as not everyone is familiar with the term ETFs or bonds or loans, etc. But on the other hand, in case of movies, for example, Almost everyone is familiar with the term action movie. So one of the applications of financial recommender system is RoboAdvisor. That is an AI-driven virtual financial advisor, which is specifically for investing and portfolio management recommendations. 
And Robo Advisors basically provides a digital alternative for human financial advisors. A typical RA asks questions about the investor's demographics, investment needs, financial goals, risk tolerance, et cetera. And then the RA builds an algorithmic driven financial portfolio for the investors, recommends that portfolio. And if the investor accepts the portfolio, then the system also automatically invest on investor's behalf. But even such systems have many limitations, actually. Uh, the first and most important one is, of course, the lack of explanations. Unlike in-person advice, users of robo-advisors cannot ask for explanations and reasoning for the recommended portfolio. And the reason is that these systems are still operating as black box. Even in few cases where they provide very limited type of explanations, they are still typically designed from the algorithmic perspective without considering the user's perspective into account. And furthermore, users um, might have different needs and requirements for explanations in different domains, which are typically not considered when providing explanations. So to address the challenges of um, designing explainable robo-advisors from the user perspective, we basically attempted to address the following research questions. First one is, what are the domain-specific needs for explanations in the context of specifically robo-advisors? How important are these explanations for the users? And how the quality of existing explanations is perceived by the user? of robo-advisor systems. So to address our research questions, we used a mixed method approach by conducting both qualitative and quantitative studies. So the first research question, which basically focuses on the what aspect of explanation, uh, we conducted three qualitative focus group discussions to explore the domain specific need for explanations by users. The second research question is related to how aspect to understand the user's importance for specific explanations and the user's perception of existing explanations in robo-advisor systems. And for this purpose, we conducted a quantitative online survey where we specifically um, evaluated the personal relevance and perceived quality of explanations. So let's um, see how we conducted our qualitative study. So um, in this qualitative study, we aim to identify the user needs for explanations in financial domain. And we conducted three focus group discussions in which we recruited participants using convenience sampling approach uh, from different background and expertise in finance domain. And the idea is to understand the user's need from different perspectives. So we got some participants which were domain experts. They had extensive experience and background in the finance domain. Then we had HCI experts that were quite technical people, but they did not have any background and, expert, and expertise in the finance domain. And then the third group was common users. They were basically, uh, again, um, are using our social network, we recruited them. Um, they had diverse background, but they had no or very limited uh, background and expert experience in the finance domain. So to conduct domain experts focus group and common users, we did that online. And HCI focus group discussion was conducted in presence. And for online discussions, we prepared a virtual board using Miro. Uh, to collect thoughts and structure the discussion. And for HCI group, we just brainstormed the ideas using sticky notes. So the procedure for um, this um, focus group discussion was basically similar for all three groups, where participants were first given a walkthrough to a replica of a real German robo-advisor, which is Bivester. Uh, participants were then asked to explore and critically analyze each page of the prototype. 
they evaluated each page and were asked as part of the brainstorming to write down any questions they want the system to answer or explain to them. And these questions could be related to any aspect of the system which are unclear to them, but require further explanation. Then we asked them to present their written questions and create uh, clusters of similar questions. So for our analysis um, of our qualitative data, we use the approach of thematic analysis. And uh, so in total, we collected 107 responses in the context of requesting an explanation from the system. For coding our data, uh, we use the theoretical classification of explanations presented in this paper, where explanations are classified into four main categories, depending on the type of information sources used to generate those explanations. And we try to map our qualitative responses in terms of these coded definitions of different types of explanations. So interesting thing that we found is that many of the responses that we collected do not fall in any of the explanation categories mentioned here. Our further thematic analysis reveals that information is one of the major aspects that people requested in the context of explanation. So they wanted to have definition of specific terms or concepts. And you can see here that uh, 51 of these responses we could actually map in terms of the information aspect. Another aspect which was not that prominent, but is still worth mentioning is the aspect of shared understanding where participants requested for explanation about how the system interpreted the answers given by the participants on the initial questionnaire of RoboAdvisor. And typically these two are two aspects or categories are the ones that came as an as a result of our focus group discussions, but they were they or they were not considered or they could not be actually mapped in terms of the existing theoretical categories of explanations. But people seem to want these additional categories to perceive the system explainable. So as a result of our focus group uh, discuss discussion, um, it showed that users need users needs for explanations in the financial domain are not restricted to only recommender explanations that we get from traditional classification of explanations, but they seem to want these additional domain specific information or explanations related to how system has interpreted their input in terms of shared understanding. So this somehow kind of partially addressed our first research question where we identified some user needs in the context of financial domain. And then um, to address our second research question, we conducted a follow-up online survey by recruiting the same participants from the focus group discussion. And in this one, we specifically evaluated the personal relevance with respect to domain specific categories that we identified as a result of focus group discussion. And we also evaluated personal relevance of explanations with respect to domain general categories that we got from this theoretical background. Additionally, we also evaluated the perceived quality of explanations. And to do so, we basically used explanation item from the existing evaluation framework, but most of the items were actually self-created, inspired from the focus group discussion responses. So this is how the results look like when we try to um, explore the perceived personal relevance of explanation with respect to our categories that we um, 
found out as, as, as a result of focus group discussion. I will not go into too much numbers here, but if you are interested to look into the statistics, you can always go back and refer, um, check my paper. But just to give you um, or, or highlight the interesting, some interesting um, findings, uh, we, we saw some uh, differences in terms of how different groups have uh, different needs for different explanation categories here, um, even though the results are not significant, but um, we still, still saw some tendencies and differences. Uh, in terms of intercategory differences, um, even though the recommender explanation category uh, had marginally higher personal relevance for participants, but overall in terms of uh, all three categories, the mean scores were quite high. And which basically shows that these all three um, categories um, seem to be quite relevant for participants. So when we evaluated personal relevance of explanation with respect to these domain general categories, um, one interesting pattern that we saw was that HCI experts seem to have marginally higher personal relevance for all four of these categories. So they actually, for them, it was important to have everything in the system design. Um, but again, the results were not significant. Uh, but in terms of intercategory, we actually saw that input output explanation and procedural explanations uh, are basically have uh, basically significantly higher personal relevance for people. Um, but the most interesting thing that we saw here is that we also tried to compare these two different taxonomies of explanation categories, one which were empirically derived from our focus groups and one which was theoretically uh, present. And we saw that the empirically one received significantly higher personal relevance score, uh, showing that people actually, for people, it was actually more important to have also these additional categories like information and shared understanding to be present in the system. Then we also wanted to investigate that how um, people perceive the quality of explanations that are already present in the existing robo advisors. And one interesting finding that we saw here is that for all three categories, sorry, the mean scores were very, very bad. They were marginally poor, so marginally quite low. And showing that the existing systems, uh, the quality of uh, explanations provided in the in existing system is perceived relatively bad by, all, by the participants, indicating that there is a need to improve the explainability of these systems. So, um, Qualitative results overall showed that domain-specific explanations are significantly important as compared to the domain general ones that we saw in earlier. Uh, thus, we can say partially addressing the research questions too. I will explain why I'm saying partially. Um, then the existing explanations provided by the robo-advisor systems are perceived relatively low. So still addressing partially. Uh, the reason is that uh, we had a very small sample size. Uh, so even though our results are showing some valuable insights, but we cannot concretely say that these are the actual results. But uh, critical reflection here is that uh, there are domain specific needs for explanations from the users that need to be integrated in the system design but showing only recommender explanations might not be sufficient for users in specific domains. And providing additional domain-specific information 
and explanation related to some shared understanding in addition to this existing recommender explanations have shown to be important for users to perceive the system explainable. And then we also show, uh, we also saw that different people seem to have different needs for explanations, even though our results did, didn't show any significant results, but it still showed some uh, interesting patterns. So as I mentioned earlier, the major limitation of our work was that small sample size, especially for the quantitative study. Uh, but as we use the mixed method approach, so we recruited the same participants from the focus group discussion in our quantitative study. And that is uh, one of the major limitation of our work. But currently, actually, we are um, in a phase of designing a new study where we want to validate the findings by conducting the study and improving the study structure on large sample size. And the future work, uh, we want to present some design implications to enhance explainability of such financial recommender systems from the user perspective. So thank you, that was all from my side. I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you. Questions? Is there any question also from people attending online? Okay, it's not my domain, but I try to ask a question. Uh, so the financial domain is a quite complex domain. Do you think some of the results you get are generalizable to other complex domains? Um, yeah, actually, um, it could be, but again, um, it also depends on domain. Um, so even if both domains are complex, but they, they might have different, users might have different needs in those domains. So um, I think this, this needs to be, uh, actually, this is an interesting thing. So maybe in the future work, we can also try to pick two complex domains and try to see whether these can be generalizable or not. But um, our main argument here is that even if, if the domain is complex, users might have different needs in specific domains. And that is because people need some domain specific information and that basically differs in each domain, so. Okay, thank you. Any other question? Uh, hi, uh, this is Jim from Bloomberg. Uh, thank you for the interesting talk. I have a question about the, the observation of the first one. You mentioned that the, they need not only explanations, they also need additional information uh, or shared understanding, etc. I wonder whether it's really about, is it about the explanation itself or it's more about their inherent being trust? Like they don't just don't trust that the system can reason like them because they're domain experts. Okay. Um, so the question, the main question of our focus group discussion, which we asked the participants to analyze based, analyze based on that question was, we asked, specifically asked them to write down any questions that they have in mind that they want the system to explain them. So anything, any aspect of the system that was unclear to them, we asked them to write it down, which they want the system to answer or explain them. So anything they wrote uh, as part of their focus group discussion was in the context of explanations. Mm -hmm. And one interesting thing that we found out that people even have different understanding of what explanation is. And that is what we also saw in our qualitative responses. So even though they think they were asking questions related to explanations, but we found out that they are not actually explanations, people have different understanding, but they are actually related to the aspect of information because in most of the cases, they were just asking to the system to define some specific terminology and concept, which is not explanation. But um, for, for the user to perceive the system as explanation, our results somehow show that providing 
only recommender explanations might not be sufficient enough. You need some additional things to support this explainability for user. So okay. that was our main takeaway from this whole study. All right, thank you. Thank you. So let's thank again the speaker. Okay, we go with the third and last presentation of this session. Uh, the paper is what if interactive explanation in scientific literature recommender system and uh, is going to pre be presented by Muad Gersmi. Yes. Okay. Can you see my screen? Not yet. A black screen. Okay, just a second. It seems you were sharing, but uh, still black. Yeah. Okay. Now it's. Can you see now? Yeah. Please. Okay, so uh, good day everyone. This is Moat. I'm a PhD student at, the student at the University of Duisburg, Essen, Germany. And today I will present our work named uh, What if Interactive Explanation in a Scientific Literature Recommender System? So actually our work is aligned with the notes presented in the keynote presentation today regarding the design of the visual explanation in the AI systems. So um, in the explainable recommender system domain, uh, explanations are used to alleviate the black box problem. Uh, an explanation is inherently a, a social process and uh, uh, for that it should be uh, interactive and conversational. Uh, interactivity as a feature is well established in the recommender system domain as it has been improved that it, it can improve the user experience and trust in the recommender system. However, uh, interactive explanation is uh, there is a lack of research on interactive explanation and especially how to design interactive explanation how to um, implement them and evaluate them are still open questions it's important in this stage to mention the difference between interactive explanation and interactive recommendation as both uh, give the user the control over the recommendation process uh, interactive recommendation goals is mainly to improve and personalize the recommendation However, the goal of the interactive explanation is to uh, help users uh, for better understanding of the model and help the system designers for better model debugging. Uh, in this work, we focus uh, on what if explanation as a possible mechanism uh, to achieve uh, explainable uh, inter interactive explanation in the recommender system. Briefly, so uh, definition of what if explanation. It's an assumption what the application would do given a set of user set input values. In uh, explainable AI, this explanation is used to show how the changes in the future could uh, impact the model prediction. And similarly, in recommender systems, it shows how the manipulation of the input could affect the results of the recommendation. Also, it's important to mention the difference between what if interaction and what if explanation, as what if interaction is quite uh, famous in the literature. So in what if uh, interaction, the user will interact with the system input and uh, can see the impact of these changes on the recommendation element. However, in the what if explanation, when the user interacts with the, the input, the uh, changes will appear on the explanation interface itself. And at that point, the user can decide either to apply these changes or not. So, uh, Mainly our uh, aim in this, uh, in this paper is to incorporate this what if explanation in our uh, RIMA application, which stands for uh, a transparent recommendation and interest model uh, modeling application. Uh, as the name tells, uh, this application provide explainable uh, interest models and uh, explainable recommendations. 
So in this paper, we focus more on explaining, uh, on uh, recommending uh, literature uh, publications uh, by computing the similarity between the interest model uh, of the user and the keywords extracted from the title and the abstract from the candidate papers. Also, uh, we leverage explanatory visualization to design this uh, what if explanation uh, by giving the user the control over the system and uh, to uh, track the, the changes in, in real time. So our question, we started first, how to design this uh, what if explanation? We started by investigating the literature we, where we found that uh, the, uh, the explanation, uh, it should be, it should be uh, interactive and provided in a visual way. Uh, also adapted from the uh, explainable AI uh, domain, we aim to provide local and global what if explanation. So uh, in a nutshell, global what if, uh, global explanation is uh, to give an overview of how the system uh, or the uh, of the ma machine learning model is uh, performing, and the local uh, explanation it shows the similarity or uh, the relationship between imp one uh, input output uh, pairs. Building on top of the findings from the literature, we aim to uh, we aim we applied the uh, or we follow the human centered design uh, approach uh, to involve users in our uh, design process. Our target target group uh, were mainly uh, people interested in general uh, in uh, scientific uh, literature in general. In this uh, in this approach, we had three iterations and for each iterations, five different potential users will involve to give, uh, to evaluate and give feedback for the prototypes. So we started by the observation phase where we collected uh, the user's requirement and an explainable scientific literature recommender system. Uh, we collected user's expectation from the uh, what if explanation and the level of interactivity that they are expecting to get uh, over this explanation. Uh, our results of this phase showed that we got four scenarios of the usage of this what-if explanation. First, users could not be uh, satisfied with the whole recommender system results, or the recommender uh, or recommended uh, recommended publications are not are not expected. Uh, the third scenario that the user uh, want to interact with the recommender system to discover more recommendation. And the last scenario when the user is not satisfied with the specific recommendation, and they are inter and uh, he or she uh, uh, is interested in knowing why or the reason behind given this uh, recommendation. Uh, moving to the next step, which is ideation. So we brainstorming. Uh, we started with a brainstorming session. We were where we collected the ideas. Then we discussed them, following the pitch and critic approach, and we voted on the best ideas. Then we categorized them. Uh, based on the scenarios from the previous uh, iteration. So here we have uh, two different scopes. Uh, we call them global what-if explanation and local what-if explanation. And uh, the relevant scenarios for the global are the first uh, three scenarios. Uh, and the questions addressed here are, for example, what if I change the weights of my interests? Or what if I change my interest by adding new ones or deleting the existing one? Uh, as for the local what if explanation, it fits more the fourth scenario. Um, the questions addressed here are what if I change my interest by adding, deleting, or modifying the weight? And uh, the other option is what if I change the keywords extracted from the publication by adding new keywords or deleting existing one? Moving to the prototyping process. So the first uh, iteration here we provided low fidelity prototypes. Uh, the aim is to provide an overview of how the whole uh, publication set and to show the relationship between the interests uh, of the user and the candidate publications. Here we suggested three visualizations and uh, the interactions uh, provided here are the user can select the publications or change the weight using the slider. After testing, uh, the users uh, prefer to have bar chart over the other visualization provided, and they have some suggestions like uh, they suggest to highlight the new common publications after the interaction. For the local what if explanation, so the aim here is to show the relationship between the interests and one uh, specific publication. Uh, in this uh, what if explanation, the user can manipulate either 
the, uh, his interests, like what I have explained before by adding new or deleting or changing the weight, but also a uh, user can manipulate the keywords uh, extracted from the publication. The same, we suggested some visualizations with some interaction and we test the, our prototypes. Uh, I will go quickly for the sake of time. The second iteration, we came up with high fidelity prototypes considering the feedback from the previous iteration. And uh, we collected uh, more feedback uh, in this iteration to come up with uh, good prototypes to be implemented at the end. Um, this is for the local explanation. User can man manipulate uh, the uh, interest model and can uh, also manipulate the uh, extracted keywords from the publication in high fidelity prototypes. The last iteration, uh, we came up with, uh, we improved the prototypes and we implement them in our uh, application. So a quick uh, tour in our uh, main user interface uh, application. So on the top, we can see the list of the uh, interests. This, these are the top interests uh, of, uh, of a user. And here we can see in the middle the list of uh, the recommended publications uh, in form of, a bo of boxes. In each box, we can see on the top uh, on the top right, a similarity score between this publication and the whole interest model. Uh, also, we have a, a, a band color uh, with the colors of the uh, interests. So the user can match directly which interest has more similarity with this publication. And also we are providing the what if uh, global and local. So the local button is uh, provided on the bottom right of the box and the global what if explanation provided next to the uh, all the interest model. Moving to the global what if explanation. These are the final prototypes. On the left, we can see the initial interface and on the right, the interface after interaction. We can see that the user here added two more uh, interests and the change of the threshold of the recommendation. So we can see the blue uh, color represent the paper remained to be recommended. The green represented the new publications came after the uh, interaction and the red uh, present the, the publication to be omitted. As the user requested, we, we make these bars clickable. So when, uh, and these bars represent papers. So when a, a user click on, uh, on a bar, he can see the similarity, uh, the similarity between this specific paper and all the interests in one interface. Moving to the local what if explanation. So this is the interest manipulation part. On the left side, this uh, we can see the initial interface uh, where user can uh, manipulate this uh, interface by adding or deleting uh, interests or change of the threshold. We can see the impact in real time of this uh, changes. So the user can see that this paper will be uh, recommended or uh, will not be recommended anymore after the changes. The same for the local what if explanation, the keyword manipulation part. So we have a box here containing the keywords extracted from the publication and other keywords uh, which are coming from the publication from the publication but they are not counted or they are not uh, included in the computational uh, process so the user can delete keywords from uh, from here or add new ones from the red uh, from the right uh, box and can change the threshold also. And in real time, the user can check the status of the paper, it will be recommended or not. So in order to evaluate our approach, we conducted the moderated uh, think aloud sessions and semi-structured interviews with 12 uh, students and researchers uh, to uh, evaluate the uh, perception of this what if explanation in uh, unexplainable recommender systems. So uh, in order to measure the usage and uh, the attitude toward our system, we used the rescue framework and uh, we conducted a deductive analysis uh, to get to find more, again, more insights of uh, the results coming from the rescue. And we use uh, four themes here, namely transparency and trust, user control, satisfaction, and overall user experience. So our results show that this is the explanation has uh, uh, lead to uh, more transparency. So the transparency here is accepted to a certain extent. Uh, the users get uh, understand the, the weight influence, how the weight is influencing the, the process, uh, the recommendation process. 
However, the role of the keyword is still not clear for some of them. Also, um, we found a positive effect on the trust as the features that we are providing uh, has led to more trust in the system. However, there were some uncertainties in extracting keywords from the publication as one of the participants, for example, mentioned. Uh, some relevant keywords were not extracted from the publication. In terms of user control and satisfaction, so mainly we got positive feedback about the controllability provided to the user, and this controllability has led to uh, more satisfaction where most of the participants were satisfied with the with the with the, the, the provided uh, what if explanation and they mentioned that they will use the global one to adjust their interest and they prefer to use the local one to correct the system and discover more uh, or to know more about the uh, influential interest in terms of overall user experience so we can see that uh, the the people like the control the provided controllability uh, that they have over the system and also the real-time uh, track, they can see in real time the changes uh, and the impact of the changes that they have made on the interest model. And also the feature of the scrutability so they can correct a relevant recommendation by changing the item uh, responsible for uh, providing the wrong uh, recommendation. And we got uh, generally a good feedback, a positive uh, feedback regarding the usability of the, uh, of the what-if explanation. However, uh, some participants mentioned that the visualization was complicated. For example, uh, they mentioned it takes some time to get what the information in the chart is provided. Uh, also, people suggest to improve the user interface as we are they perceive that we are using too much colors. And uh, also, uh, the cont control on the keywords interface, it was not easy for them to find it as it is a sub part of the local what if explanation. Uh, so our takeaway, this uh, work found out that what if explanation ha explanations have a positive effect on different aspects of recommender systems, mainly on user control. In the, and uh, in our future work, we are planning to conduct uh, quantitative studies to investigate the effect of what if explanation on the perception of and interaction with an explainable recommender system. Thank you so much, and I'm welcoming your questions and comments. Questions? Uh, thanks, Moa. That's a really interesting work. Uh, but what is puzzling me that you 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 arguing that what you do is explanations. Uh, see, I, I would classify that as a combination of transparency and user control. You can change preferences. You can change the way system works. And also, you, the system transparently should show the result of the changes. And transparency is kind of very important for user control as well. It does look like explanation. Is there any reason you believe it's explanation? Because would you present at the workshop focusing on explanations? That would be nature. You need to connect with people in the workshop. But this workshop focusing on interaction, and it's already interaction, even if it's not explanation. So could you clarify any specific reason to argue that what you show is really explanation? Maybe actually a joint discussion, but the work is certainly interesting. I just the question of terminology. Because people did the same work before, docking and docking interest done before, right? Changing the level of preference, Beckham did it uh, twice, uh, but never it has been called what if explanations. Um, thank you for raising this uh, question. I think the main difference here is that the what if interaction, the the uh, the changes will uh, happen directly on the on the on the output of the system. However. And this explanation, the user will interact with the interface of the explanation, and the results will be will be considered as hypothetical results. For example, we can say so the user can see the changes, the impact of the uh, the, the relationship between this input output uh, relationship, and if they agree on the changes, they can apply this on the recommendation process. So somehow they are not interacting with the system itself, but the the explanation element, which is on top of the system, that's how we how, that's how we are differentiating between interaction and explanation. Uh, I hope this answers your question. Any other questions? 
Yes. Um, thank you for the presentation. Uh, have you thought about uh, if uh, giving control to the user, uh, how that will affect the overall recommendations, like user with high interaction with the system, how that will affect recommendations on the user with low interaction with the system? Um, I believe uh, the main... Uh impact will be on term of uh, the accuracy of the recommendations. It will be more personalized and it will be more accurate as the user is steering the recommendation process. Okay. Uh, and one more question is, uh, have you thought about like, how do you validate user interaction and user feedback? Um, can you please elaborate more? Uh, like whatever user um, putting feedback on the recommendations, how do you justify their feedback is authentic or it's right for the system? So I think mainly we use this uh, HCD approach to involve users in the design process. So we design the, the, the explanation based on the user's requirements. So from the beginning, the requirements of the user are considered. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. Any other questions? Uh, great talk. I, I can go next. Uh, it's a real quick question. Um, if you go to the UX evaluation part, there was uh, something called interface adequacy. I was just really, uh, I was just curious what that meant exactly. So how do you define interface adequacy? So mainly this was a construct of the uh, rescue framework. And uh, here we ask the users about the positioning of the buttons, the colors, the positioning of the, the layout in general, how we are calling the uh, tabs. For example, what if local explanation, what if global explanation, uh, what the user is seeing actually in the end the interface in terms of layout and labels. It's more, for example, we are using so many technical words that lay users or uh, users who are not familiar with the recommender system will not get it. That's right. what we want to evaluate. So how is that different from quality? Just to, is that because it's the adequacy is has a satisfaction component? Exactly. So uh, you mean quality of the recommendation or uh, the interface? Right, so uh, so on the right hand side it says recommendation quality, uh, and it has three dimensions there, and then it has it says interface adequacy, uh, which I'm assuming is also perceived. Both of those are perceived dimensions. I was just wondering how those were different. So how is the quality construct, um, or, or is that at perceived adequacy not a part of perceived quality? Uh, actually, they are two different constructs. So we have questions related to the recommendation correctly separately and the interface adequacy separately. So uh, maybe I didn't get your question correctly. Can you please elaborate more? Um, yeah, I, I was just I was just curious how those two were different exactly. I, I think I, I think I have my answer though. Uh, I feel like the it's made up of labels and I, I see labels and layout and then under quality it's accuracy, diversity, and novelty. Um, okay, cool. Um, they are the Construct actually. Right. It's not so the interface adequacy is under recommendation quality. They are they are at the same level. Two different construct. It's not part of the recommendation quality. Uh, no, I understand that. So what what I'm asking is, you know, if, if you're asking a recommendation user if the labels are adequate, mm -hmm. uh, does is does that mean that those labels are in the right place spatially are they visually appealing i'm the word adequate or the, maybe i'm just not familiar with the the source framework the rescue framework that you guys used but um yeah so that that's all i was really uh, needing to know is what what adequacy referred to uh with the labels in the layout okay i hope i answered your question all right thanks thank man. you okay thank you uh we thank you again the speaker
we thank can you. close this session and uh, uh, thanks also for uh, the discussion. Uh, we will come back at uh, 4 p.m. with uh, the uh, third session on interactive recommended system. And uh, uh, we have uh, quite long uh, breaks since uh, in order to allow the remote speakers uh, to give the presentation at the same time according to their local time. So we will meet at 4 p.m. for the last session and uh, the closing. Thank you.